Darlene, would you be able to clean two things? Welcome to the third EU LAC Museums webinar. My name is Jamie Allen Brown and I am the EU LAC Museums Project Administrator, based at the University of St Andrews in Scotland. It is my honour today to welcome you all here to our webinar series entitled Community Based Museums in Times of Crisis. We will begin in a few moments. Please may I ask our volunteer translator, Anna, to introduce herself. Hello, uh, my name is Anna Gonzalez. I am a research assistant to the project and I will be supporting the webinar in the Q&A session. Hola, soy Anna Gonzalez, soy asistente del proyecto y los voy a apoyar con traducción en la sesión de preguntas y respuestas. Thank you, Anna. Firstly, I would like to offer some technical information regarding today's webinar series. Today, we are broadcasting live via Zoom platform and broadcasting via our Facebook page, where over 10,600 people like our page and find out more about our ADLAC Museums project and research being conducted across Europe, Latin America and the Caribbean. Following feedback from our first and second webinar, we have, I am delighted to confirm that we have the support of volunteer translation from Anna, as well as automated translation subtitles. Please remember that these subtitles are not always perfect or accurate. If you would like to ask a question during the webinar or have a comment, or indeed just say hello, please feel free to use the chat box and the Q&A options on the Zoom platform. If you're watching via Facebook, please leave a comment and we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. All questions will be answered at the end of the webinar session. A webinar recording will be available after the webinar via our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, and our project web portal and website. The addresses are listed on the screen now. Panelist biographies will be available via our website and web portal, as well as listed on our Facebook and YouTube channel. Following our first and second webinars, we have issued over 400 certificates of participation for taking part. If you indeed would like a certificate of participation for this webinar, please email eulacmuseums at st-andrews.ac.uk. Please remember that we are a small coordination team and there may be a delay in receiving your certificate due to the demand. Now, I will pass you over to our project coordinator, 
and Director of the Institute of Museums, Galleries and Collections, based at the University of St Andrews, Dr Karen Brown. Hola, buenos dias y bienvenidos a todos. My name is Karen Brown. As Jamie said, I'm coordinator of this um, very large project called EU LAC Museums. We're a big team and we work hand in hand. Um, you're very welcome if this is your third time joining us. Thank you for coming back. If this is your first time, you're very welcome. Um, we've got quite a lot to get through today. So to kick off, we are going to hear from our project PhD candidate, Kate Keohan, in the first instance. Kate is going to introduce the project for you. She, her research is supported by the EULAC project and it focuses on post-colonialism, ecology and community making. So without any further ado, welcome Kate. Thank you so much, Karen. At its heart, EULAC Museums investigates the cultural scientific and social relations between Europe, Latin America and the Caribbean in the field of community museology. Initiated in response to an EU Horizon 2020 grant, the project has been managed by legal entity beneficiaries in eight countries who share a commitment to working with small local museum communities in order to build social cohesion and reconciliation. Together, we have sought to consider differences as well as common visions for sustainable, small to medium sized local and regional museums in their communities. This has been strategized through relation to a number of EU CELAC action plan themes and areas of research inquiry, including technology and innovation for bi-regional integration, museums for social inclusion and cohesion, fostering sustainable community museums and exhibiting migration and gender. Partners, working both within their own countries and bi-regionally, have developed a number of work packages and deliverables to respond to these ideas. And while we realize now how fortunate this was, we were able to meet in person on a number of occasions. By and large, our communication took place online and through alternative platforms. In so doing, we had to refigure the notion of community itself, not as an easy feedback loop, but rather as a system where shared spaces had to be considered in order to create a complex and timely discussions about shared issues. A number of initiatives within the project spring to mind for exemplifying this, particularly a project between the University of Valencia and partners in Peru and Chile, where they considered water as a shared heritage site and source, and the Caribbean, where contemporary art was used as a way of considering the themes of migration and gender, where exhibitions took place across the region and then have subsequently traveled. And also the youth project, which is beautiful in a number of ways, where a number of, a group of young people in Portugal, Costa Rica and Scotland traveled in person by regionally and also connected through their education and systems of community heritage, where they considered what it is to be from a small place and to work locally and communicate globally and to work out how they can communicate best their cultural heritage for the future. In order to successfully achieve this community heritage work, it was necessary to develop a number of technological innovations. These have taken place in three particular ways. Firstly, the creation of a dynamic web portal where you can find out more about the project and where the project primarily shares its news also, the development of a number of te technological work packages, which can be taken up by community museums um, to do training. And thirdly, a virtual museum where the products of the training can be put online. In particular, the teams which are later going to speak in the seminar have been teaching students how to 360 degree scan um, objects of particular importance within community museums, and then also scanning the museum themselves in order to do virtual tours and walk around. I'm sure that I'm not alone in at this moment recognizing the enormous importance of these technologies, not only for our own research, but also for our teaching, where once we might have had the objects in front of us, now these uh, virtual museums and artifacts have become critical, not only for protecting our cultural heritage, in times of ecological and environmental crisis, but also for connecting with others when we're stuck within the bounds of our own homes. 
Now, more than ever, as many museologists are considering, it is time that we reevaluate the concept of the museum itself. The museum can no longer serve as a didactic, static educational environment, but now must work with and for its communities um, as a space that is both imaginative and physical for acting with affirmative action in relation to shared issues. I very much look forward to hearing the participation from a number of colleagues from both within the EU Light Museums project and beyond today into how technological innovation can aid in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Kate. We really appreciate that. Is, can everybody hear me? Is my connection okay? My name is yes. Lauren. Yes, okay, thank you. My name is Lauren. I'm on the steering committee of the EU LAC Museums Project. Kate, thank you so very much for giving that wonderful um, summary of our wonderful project that, that has been led uh, from the University of St. Andrews, but incorporates participants from both the EU uh, area region and Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, we begin today with um, some reflections from one of our members of our um, steering committee, another member of our steering committee, Gustavo San Roman. Um, Gustavo is excuse me one second, um, originally from Uruguay. He's a member, as I mentioned before, of the steering committee of the EU LAC Museums Project and is professor of Spanish and a specialist in Latin American literature at the University of St. Andrews. He was for many years and until 2019, the director of the Cultural Identity Studies Institute devoted to the subject, um, to a subject which has informed his research as well as his perspective of the work of the EU LAC Museum Project. He has been involved in supporting the coordination team and advising this project. Um, without further ado, Gustavo, I appreciate very much your participation today and I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Gustavo. Okay. <clears throat> Creo que hablo en español, no? Eh, Jane, sí. me parece que me toca en español. Eh, Perdón. Esto es, eh, como corresponde a, a, al proyecto, un proyecto internacional, un proyecto biregional, Europa y América. Vamos a ir cambiándonos de un idioma al otro. Eh, entonces ahora empiezo yo en mi idioma nativo. Eh, para mí es, ha sido muy interesante esta colaboración eh, porque... Soy de los pocos en el, eh, en el proyecto, eh, en este caso el proyecto, ya uno de los que hacen el, la organización, por no ser experto, especialista en museos. Eh, mi especialismo, yo soy extraño, eh, vengo de fuera en este caso, y eh, tengo un interés eh, en América Latina, soy latinoamericanista, eh, tanto por eh, profesión como por fe. Eh, mi meta es defender eh, el continente de América Latina, el grupo de países que hablan, sobre todo en español eh, y en portugués, pero también en francés y también en inglés, eh, porque me parece que hay una, una identidad general, que es la identidad de América Latina, que es difícil de definir, pero que me interesa defenderla, me interesa investigarla. Y lo que me parece que este proyecto está logrando es eh, ver a ciertas comunidades en particular, pero también al continente en general, eh, de la manera que yo recomiendo a mis estudiantes, eh, cuando hablamos de América Latina desde Europa, eh, hay dos tendencias principales que, en las que caemos consciente o inconscientemente. La primera tendencia es verlo como un país, un lugar exótico, un lugar eh, poblado por gente inocente o gente que está más allá de, los, de las fallas y de los las virtudes de los seres humanos en general. 
y que es como mirar para arriba, es idealizar, y hay otra versión que es mirarlo hacia abajo, como un continente eh, dependiente, un continente que no ha logrado lo que se supone que Europa ha logrado. Y la visión correcta, la mejor visión, es verlo como eh, ejemplos de humanidad tan valiosos como otros. Eh, o sea, una visión humanista, pero es también una visión que debe eh, entender las diferencias y los rasgos peculiares de todas estas sociedades. Y creo que este proyecto está logrando eso, está mostrando a Europa cómo es América eh, en general, en, en sus rasgos eh, generales, pero también muy específicos en algunas de sus comunidades. He tenido el gusto de visitar eh, dos de ellas, de las que tenemos aquí en persona. Eh, conozco las otras eh, eh, de manera más general. Y me parece que lo que se ha logrado hasta ahora es justamente eso. Es una visión de Europa por parte de América que es más sutil, eh, más, más valiosa, más correcta y una visión de América por parte de Europa que es eh, similarmente mejor y más correcta. Y una de las cosas que hemos visto es eh, el intercambio entre jóvenes que ha tenido lugar hasta ahora, desde un lugar remoto de Escocia hasta lugares remotos en, en América, sobre todo en, en Costa Rica. Y esto hasta ahora ha sido para mí la, lo más valioso de este proyecto. El otro aspecto que ya lo ha, de, lo ha eh, descrito eh, Kate es que vemos una visión de los museos que es más eh, válida, que es más eh, general, más abarcadora que la que teníamos eh, tradicionalmente hasta ahora. Bueno, esta ha sido entonces mi visión. Eh, de extraño a los museos, de no persona no museística, pero con interés en el proyecto, eh, en los aspectos más generales y más abarcadores de este proyecto. Muy bien, paso, porque soy consciente del tiempo, paso entonces a eh, presentar al el próximo hablante. Si te parece bien, Jamie, hago eso ahora. Tengo aquí, eh, si logro entender esta página, tengo aquí eh, una descripción de eh, la persona que va a hablar ahora. Y la persona que va a hablar ahora es eh, Julián, Julián Roa Triana, que es un consultor y un diseñador de museos que desde el 2004 ha trabajado para varios mujer, museos y organizaciones en varios países, ¿eh? en Colombia, en Perú, en Bosnia, Herzegovina y en Albania. Vemos ya el material, materializado en este, en este hombre eh, estos cambios, estos contactos que nos interesan en el proyecto. También trabaja como profesor y docente en la Facultad de Estudios del Patrimonio Cultural de la Universidad Externado de Colombia. Su investigación académica y de campo se ha concentrado en la memoria, el patrimonio cultural y los conflictos recientes, junto con organizaciones como Patrimonio Cultural Sin Fronteras y la presidencia de UNESCO de la Universidad Externado de Colombia. Actualmente trabaja como consultor independiente de museos en temas de sostenibilidad, diseño de exposiciones y diseño de museos para el Ministerio de Cultura de Colombia y el Museo Nacional de Colombia. Es miembro de la Junta Directiva de la Alianza Regional del ICOM para América Latina y del el Caribe, ICOM-LAC. Hablará entonces ahora sobre el tema de la accesibilidad al contenido digital para las comunidades y los museos comunitarios en el contexto de Colombia, que presenta similitudes con otros países latinoamericanos. Primero abordará el tema de la cobertura digital y el acceso a Internet, y cómo este es un problema importante para la construcción de un museo inclusivo durante estos tiempos. Luego pasará, en segundo lugar, 
a hablar sobre tres temas clave que han ganado notoriedad durante esta pandemia debido a la intensificación de las interacciones digitales del público con los museos comunitarios y que presentan desafíos importantes en términos de acceso para estas eh, instituciones. La censura como un asunto importante en entornos digitales, los derechos de autor sobre el patrimonio cultural que deberían tomar parte del dominio público y, finalmente, la inclusión de personas con discapacidad en la estrategia digital de los museos. Julián, es un placer presentarte y te... Tienes mucho que decir, pero te ruego que por favor eh, te quedes en unos 10 minutos. Son las 4 y 21 en Escocia. Así que adelante, Julián, por favor. Muchísimas gracias, Gustavo, por eh, eh, esa presentación. Eh, se escucha claramente, ¿cierto? Sí. Bueno, eh, he preparado mi presentación en la lengua inglesa. No, no sabía que podía hablar tan, tan fácilmente en español, entonces espero que me puedan entender todos. Thank you very much for this invitation. I believe that these webinars are key in this very moment of crisis and opportunity that we as humanity are experiencing and that has put a lot of pressure on the museum sector all over the world. Uh, today, as uh, Gustavo said, I would like to speak on one of the challenges that most community museums all over Latin America have in regard of accessibility to digital content creation the issue of digital coverage is a major problem to be solved and how the implementation of digital contents creates other substantial problems related to issues such as censorship in digital environments, copyrights and cultural heritage that should be part of the public domain. And finally, the inclusion of people with disabilities in the digital strategy of community museums. Uh, next, please. First, I would like to show some statistics to make my point on the huge gap between cities in Latin America and some of the poorest regions. Here one can see uh, some of the big data on digital coverage for, for the biggest and more developed city in Colombia, which is uh, Bogota. As you can see, there is a wide range of accessibility to digital technologies and citizens have the opportunity to use them for purposes related with culture. For instance, more than 80% of people in Bogota have the, the opportunity to enjoy a digital content from a museum in their smartphones. Although this data is from 2018, it puts on perspective the issue of access to museums during these times of pandemics and quarantine. I want you to remember this last number, the use of radio for community purposes and non-digital technology in Bogota is around 19%. Next, please. Here, we can see the same data for one of the poorest regions in Colombia, Chocó. Located by the Pacific coast, this region is subject to the whole range of problems that Colombia has as a country. Poor development, lack of infrastructure, environmental destruction, systematic racism. Most of the people in Chocó is from African diaspora descent. And of course, they are located in the crossroads of illegal mining and drug trafficking. With these numbers, one can see that there is a huge gap in digital coverage between cities and some regions in Colombia. Less than 60% of citizens has access to a smartphone, and subsequently, the use of internet is less than 50%. However, if we check radio use for community purposes, it doubles in comparison with cities like Bogota. I believe that the use of radio and similar forms of communication by community museums are one of the main aspects that we should take into account in terms of developing strategies that guarantee access of citizens to cultural heritage during these times in community museums. Next, please. So let's see two good practices, which I believe can show the scope of technology in museums and how can we be resourceful in times where most of museum workers, workers were subjected to quarantines with a huge responsibility in their hands to guarantee that citizens had the access to their cultural heritage. Here we can see a museum guide that was implemented by the Educational Office of the National Museum of Colombia. They took advantage of Zoom the soft, this software for meetings. 
as you probably know, in this kind of so software, it's possible to change uh, backgrounds on the screen during a meeting. This was the beginning of a huge opportunity to do a museum guide in times where the physical access to the museum space was restricted. They did a search of previously digitized material and created these backgrounds, backgrounds parties, where they did uh, virtual museum guides for citizens all over the country. As you can see, this strategy enabled the museum guides to be as histrionic and creative as they are used to be when they do a guiding inside the museum. In times for the implementation of 3D experiences, video editing and professional photography are a huge burden for museum budgets. These background parties turn out to be a simple, creative and very affordable way to do a perfect museum guide. Community museums have a huge opportunity to implement these kinds of strategies without having to spend huge amounts of money that uh, I suspect they currently do not have. Next, please. Here, we can see another practice that although it is not of digital nature, it can be a good opportunity for community-based museums. In Latin America, one can see a popular mean of communication that use that use one of the most basic and creative technologies that humans and nature have created, the voice and the language. In Colombia, it is called Perifoneo, a loudspeaker service for community announcements. They are a contemporary mean of communicating anything that happens within the community. Let me introduce you to Mr. Panama in the right-hand side corner, uh, the voice newspaper from San Basilio de Palenque. I get to meet him while we were working in a community museum in this town who has one of the few dialects of Spanish language, the Palenquero. He is in charge of singing the price of fish, deaths, birds, weddings, the news, the news on the new products from shops, and of course, of keeping this endangered language alive. I believe that this beautiful way of announcing things is a good practice that community museums need to follow and celebrate. Not always the best technology is dig digital technology. We need to turn back and learn from this very heritage that resides in the, resides in the way that community do things. Digital technologies such as blogs, web pages, and social networks could be more alive and communal if we understand the beauty that resides, for instance, in Perifoneo and voice newspapers. Digital technology has to learn something too. It is not the only language to focus on. Next, please. Let me pass to another topic in these digital times. Three issues that I have noticed during the pandemic and that poses huge questions on the role of museums in contemporary world. Next, please. First is the appalling idea of censorship that happened within our institutions. Community museums in Latin America are well embedded in the social change that most of all believe that have to happen. But communities are not homogeneous and they should never be. Citizens need to comprehend that we live in a world full of variety of a variety of opinions and contested issues. Here there is a tiny example. The Juan del Corral Museum initiated an interesting initiative to encourage local artists to reinterpret some of the works of art of their collection. One of these interventions consisted in a call for intervention on the most beloved Virgin Mary of Colombia, according with Catholic citizens. There was a huge discussion on the meaning of this intervention, of course. You can see it on the Facebook page of this museum. And I truly believe that this case could be, have been worst case scenario, a sad example of censorship. But instead of that, this community museum, thought, through the power of discussion and public debate, managed to explain why this intervention was not a sacrilege of an image, but a point of view in a sea of many beliefs that digital communication has enhanced these years, these days, or years of. Community museums need to be attentive to face these challenges and not to succumb to power in terms of political, religious, or economic power that can shoot public debate and free speech in our spaces. Be brave and do not succumb to these tensions. Instead of that, embrace them and defend the museum as a public forum for free speech, even in the most extreme cases. Next, please. 
Secondly, following the, this issue, I noticed how this digital confinement of museums due to the pandemic has posed again the issue of copyrights when using digital images of cultural heritage, most of them in the public domain. I want to show this example of a digital museum guide named The Stories of the Bicentennial that talks on topic of our national independence in Colombia, but as you can see, using a different language, a meme language to communicate aspects of Colombian history to new audiences. It uses images from several collections of paintings in the public domain, and even sometimes commercial images that could be subjected to copyrights. Some could argue that, this is that, is, that it is mandatory to reference all the images and even mentioning the collection or museum where they apparently belong to. But it is important to open this debate taking into account that these museum guides has become a kind of work of art. And to ask for reference in a meme is as silly as asking Andy Warhol or other contemporary artists to write uh, on the origin of the images that they use in the corner of their works of art. A meme is a meme and it should be considered a work of art. That poses one big question. Does cultural heritage in the public domain belong to a museum or museums or to humanity? It is necessary to solve this debate in order to guarantee that community museums can use digital content freely and to use them in this era without any restraint. We in Latin America need to demand governments and public museums to digitize their collections and make them accessible and free of charge to use them as a mean of creation and communication of our own the heritage in digital environments. Next, please. And last but not least, I would like to show this good example of inclusion in community museums. The Guillermo Leon Valencia House Museum started this splendid project of Colombian Sign Language workshops to raise awareness that against some people is being subjected to discrimination this time in quarantine. Most of the people with disabilities are struggling during these times, trying to cope with an extra border, a digital era that has not fully taken into account the idea of a universal design interface in digital communications. I believe that this workshop was a huge opportunity to subtly talk on this issue. Community museums like this one have posed this question in the public arena, at least in the museum sector and at the same time, making sure that citizens have equal access to the digital contents that museums are created with cultural heritage that belong to everyone and thus should be enjoyed and be useful for anyone. In conclusion, I would like to summarize all the major points that I have stated, stated here and that, I, and that I think are key for creating a digital environment for community museums. One, Think on digital coverage and try to use other technologies as well, even the most basic ones. Two, as a museum, be brave to talk on sensitive issues and be aware that communities need a space to express diversity in a public forum that is your museum, even at some political or economic cost. Three, most of our cultural heritage is in the public domain. Ask museums, governments, and institutions to make it digitally accessible and free of charge. And finally, think on people with disabilities during this time. They deserve to enjoy equally the magnificent and creative work that museums are offering during these troubled times. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias, Julián. Thank you so very much, Julián, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, very clear, very um, to the point, and a lot of very important points that you bring up. I think the issue of considering different digital, different technologies, not just the digital ones, is very important in these times. Es muy importante considerar el hecho de que no todos tenemos eh, acceso al internet o como habías mencionado no todos tienen múltiples eh, dispositivos en sus casas entonces it's very important to think of all the different types of technologies that we can um, use to reach our audiences and to help make a difference during these troubled times um, so thank you very much Julian for that participation from Colombia uh, we now move on to uh, a group presentation we're going to have um, the the group of the 3D EU LAC team 
uh, presentation, which consists of Dr. Alan Miller, Catherine Cassidy, both of whom are representing St. Andrews, and Kay Hall from Barbados. So let me present each one of them in turn. Um, Dr. Alan Miller is lecturer in digital heritage at the University of St. Andrews, where he works with the Open Visual Worlds, Virtual Worlds Interdisciplinary Group based in the School of Computer Science. Um, he is also director of Smart History Limited. Um, Alan has worked on many digital heritage projects with the OVW group, the Open Virtual Worlds group, and, collaborate, and collaborators in the Highlands and Islands, Islands of Scotland, as well as across Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean with the EU LAC Museums Project and also with the Cine and Cupido projects. Uh, these include capacity building projects aimed at empowering heritage volunteers and professionals, creating digital content, whether it be 3D digitalization, working with spherical media, or creating reconstructions and developing digital infrastructure, which supports the creation of virtual exhibits, exhibitions, and museums. And we'll hear specifically um, from Kay on that and the way that the, um, the, the, way that the work from St. Andrews came to help very much in the Barbados, um, in, in the case of Barbados. Examples of this work include, of course, the EU LAC Museums Project, um, the Virtual Museum of Caribbean Memory and Migration, developed largely by Dr. Ian Oliver, which were accompanied by workshops and community museums and the digitization of heritage led by Catherine Ann Cassidy. Um, digital reconstructions by Sarah Kennedy include Edinburgh from 1544 and um, other really amazing work has been done by their entire group and we can we will be submitting to you guys different links so you can see the kind of work that's done by their team. Catherine Ka Ann Cassidy is PhD student in the School of Computer Science at the University of St. Andrews and holds a Master in Literature and Museum and Gallery Studies. Um, she has led virtual museum design for the EU LAC Museums Project and developed workflows for community-led di digitalization efforts in Scotland, Europe, and Latin America, creating virtual tours, 3D objects, and virtual museums. She continues her work through other projects, including CINE, which is Connected Culture and Natural Heritage in, Northern, in the Northern Environment, and Cupido. Catherine Ann brings an interdisciplinary approach to the research group of Open Virtual Worlds, which develops emergent technologies for cultural and natural heritage organizations. Her doctoral research includes developing approaches to 3D digitization that allows the value of digital heritage to be recognized while strengthening connections between heritage, its community, and the museum through emergent technologies and their democratization. Um, and I'm going to now present Kay Hall. She is um, Education and Community Outreach Officer at the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, where she very much enjoys her job of passing on history, heritage, and culture to her fellow countrymen of all ages. In this role, she fosters partnerships with regional education bodies to ensure the propagation and revitalization of heritage education, as well as with schools, colleges, communities, and individual students to ensure that the inculcation of heritage is a rewarding lifelong learning experience. She holds a master's of education, social context and education policy from the University of the West Indies, as well as a professional training certificate in heritage culture and human resources from the University of Florence. She sits on the executive of local chapter of the Internet of ICOM Barbados and is vice chairperson and is moderator of heritage education and professional development forum for the Caribbean Heritage Network. Um, Kay's research interests include, but of course are not limited to preservation of built heritage within the context of economic growth, music as a medium for cultural retention and propagation, heritage education as a medium for inculcating social responsibility, educational uses of museums, and intangible heritage practices as a medium for heritage education and um, engagement. And of course, sorry, one last point, performance as a medium for heritage education. Um, Kay will be speaking to us on the need for museums to respond to the needs of the audiences, of their audiences, especially as it pertains to interaction, acknowledgement, and engaging content via social media, which of course we're seeing a much uh, wider use of in these times. She will utilize the Barbados Museum and Historical Society as a case study for how community sensitive museums can support their communities through isolated with continuous engagement. So I please um, pass the floor now to the team of 3D EU, the 3D EU LAC team.
Hello, thank you very much for that um, introduction. I think that myself, Catherine and Kay will have our mics open during the um, presentation and, and so feel free to uh, contribute as we as we go along. Um, but from for myself and Catherine for the for the contribution from St Andrews, um, I think we wanted to next slide please uh, to touch on a few issues. Um, first to just say a little bit about what we uh, were doing prior to COVID and then to look at the impact and the effect of COVID um, on uh, museums and society, just very briefly. Um, and then to look at three things. One, to look at the response that has happened, both our response and other people's response to the COVID crisis. Um, and then look at something what we call inherited studio, but looking at how um, to build capacity to further and strengthen um, that response and then to look at two other things looking at heritage at home how it's possible for people to access heritage from the home and then also to look at how um, coming out of lockdown it will be possible to for museums to make use of some of the technologies that are available so particularly looking at um, no touch interaction and no touch VR and local virtual museums so that's the ground that we're going to try and cover next slide please um, so I think the, the EU LAC project, um, our contribution to participation in the EU LAC project really started off with the idea of trying to build capacity, of trying to um, connect up museums and communities by using emergent technologies, technologies such as um, 3D digitization and technologies such as spherical, spherical media, but not confined to that. Also looking at wikis and mapping and other, and other things. And the chief um, mechanism that we, we used for that was to do a series of uh, workshops in, the, in countries across Latin America, the Caribbean um, and Europe. Next slide, please. Um, and so, so there, there they are. And then so if we move on <clears throat> again. So the marker show, yes. Okay, so this is this is an interesting um, graph, and I think it kind of shows some of the motivation for the project of addressing um, digital digital issues with respect to um, to heritage. And what this shows is the number of people who've got a mobile phone, and it shows it by uh, country, um, and it's the number of mobile contracts per hundred people in the population. And what is very clear is that from the graph starting from the year 2000 coming through to 2019 in the year 2000 there was a huge disparity between um uk france uh, portugal and and spain compared to countries in latin america um, and the caribbean and we can see that by the time we've got to 2019 there is a, a, a huge penetration of mobile phones and mobile contracts really across the globe that a lot of that disparity has really vanished and that translates itself you know into the into the fact that um, according to ITU statistics 95.2 percent of households in uh, Colombia have access to a mobile have access to a mobile phone so that access in the community to digital resources really exists exists um, the second thing was if we move on sorry um, yeah, the, and this is showing a response in the UK, and you can see that there's been a shift towards using mobile phones, but it's reduced, but it's, it's not as mar marked as in other parts of the globe. So then moving on um, again, and then the third point was this about the capability or the capacity. Um, so this shows the capability of digital devices, um, you know, evolving over a, a again a, a 30 40 year period and what we can see is year on year mobile phones telephones computers um, they have greater capability to deal with audio visual um, and so that therefore the types of applications and the potential for virtual reality is increasing year on year so if we then move on to the next slide and so the, as well as doing the workshops um, we also looked at developing digital infrastructure which can help um, museums connect with um, communities and project um, and project heritage um, and then moving on um, and we can see this in terms of for example digitization taking place of 
3D artifacts and then being accessible over the internet. And then next slide. Um, but has been mentioned, um, you know, there's a big disparity between the capabilities and, and the digital infrastructure that exists in different museums and in different um, locations. And so one of the sort of ideas or proposals that have come out of this project is the idea of a local virtual museum where you put a low cost device into a museum and that is able to serve up the digital content. And it is able to do so irrespective really of what the um, infrastructure in terms of internet access is. It just makes little pools of internet inside of the museum. So then anybody with a mobile phone going into that museum can get access to the digital content that is there. And so this is the idea really here is to make advantage of the digital um, resources that exist inside of the community um, and for visitors to the community so that they can get access to um, heritage and digital representations of heritage. So next slide. Um, and, and yeah, so that this slide really sums up those ideas. In the case where museums don't have resources, often communities do. So we're looking at trying to use the existing digital literacies and connecting those connecting those things up um, through through low cost devices that can be embedded inside of museums. So to get an idea that the cost of the devices we're talking about are somewhere between 50 and 200 pounds. Um, and from that, you can then serve up 3D digital objects, um, virtual tours and the like inside of the museum that people can access through their mobile devices that they carry with them in their pocket already. So that was really kind of where we were at and what we were doing prior to the COVID um, onset of COVID. And if we just switch, switch on, people may be kind of like, like aware, next slide please, that um, the impact of COVID in, in um, the UK has been pretty high. We've, we've got very high um, death rates. We've been in lockdown for um, three, to four, uh, three to four months, next slide. And in the process of that knockdown, the heritage sector essentially has closed down. Uh, all museums are shut, visitors shut. We're not supposed to um, move around. Next slide, please. If you just flick, flick through these slides, that'll be fine. So the financial impact has been high. There's been a societal response. So a lot of support for health workers and ideas of sympathy and solidarity um, in, inside of society, which have been really um, heart, heartwarming. Um, but then moving on to the heritage response, we can see that there have been lots of um, events have taken place that the whilst the heritage sector physically has closed down that there has been a big response um, and I think Catherine you, you were going to chip in a bit about this side of, side of things. I'll take it from here okay so talking about the overall heritage response and a, a lot of it I'm sure we've all seen um, and also been a part of um, but just that there's been significant digital engagement globally in response to lockdown. Uh, and a lot of these engagements have been creative and pushing and expanding boundaries and also just fun. Uh, the significance is the forms that these responses have taken and where they've been uploaded. So it's not, we've realized that it's not necessarily we need to push this content onto our website. It's been, we need to push this content now to our social media website and online archival resources are larger projects that you still have seen over lockdown, but they've been bigger boulders that have been slower moving and you really have to plan and look forward to it. But with social media, it's that quick engagement. It still has a lot of planning involved with it, but it and still thought out, but you can do it daily or, or multiple times, uh, multiple times a day. Go ahead, next slide. Uh, so engagement, different kinds of engagement, but live streams has seen a huge uptick during this lockdown and especially live streams with already established platforms such as Facebook have been invaluable ways for museums to connect and deliver content, but also discuss within and beyond their communities. Uh, just stay on the, the slide. Thank you. Uh, so and it's an easy way for people to do to start up to do a live stream because you can do it starting on your phone or if you're uh, home, home set up, if you're already set up with a camera to do maybe work calls or something like that. Um, as a platform, you know, if Facebook can be a quite easy way to do that. So these are just two examples. The previous one was um, 
uh, Facebook Live on our research page about safeguarding heritage in Tanzania. And this one was a live event with the Finlagen Trust about the Lord of the Isles, um, which have fabulous numbers, had good numbers live, but even better reach uh, later because it stays on and is live. Uh, so next slide. Uh, also promoting digital exhibitions such as Barbados Museum Historical Society, which I'll let Kay talk about a little bit later, but with their exhibition Enigma of Arrival, which was promoted recently because of Windrush Day. So taking in something that's happening in the world, but then also that digital exhibition, putting it together. And we incorporated a live uh, event that talked through the exhibition and interviewed, interviewed curators and creative responses to that historical event. Next slide. So, yep, so through some of the, next slide, some of the live, live event a little bit. Next slide, thanks. So, and just touching on other platforms such as Twitter, having things happen absolutely accidentally, which was hashtag the cowboy, which was just giving the social media accounts over to the security guard overnight, him not knowing anything about social media and kind of having this accidental celebrity happen overnight, which has now kind of allowed them to continue on with a template and a format uh, and has just increased their, uh, their followership on Twitter. And that's the National Cowboy Museum. Next slide. Uh, reaching out to gaming platforms. So using something like Twitch, which is notoriously used by gamers, um, but having, this is the Monterey Bay Aquarium, using or having scientists come and talk on uh, while they're playing Animal Crossings, but having that live stream. So having it as an informal discussion with experts in the field while they're running around Animal Crossings in their digital museum and aquarium. Next slide. And things like TikTok, which is touching for the like younger generation because that is a platform that is widely used, um, but there's hashtag uh, learn on TikTok. So it's promoting museums and different other kind of learning uh, organizations to start to join it and start to start to become a part of that movement. So notoriously Tim Pierce of the Carnegie Museum with his snail dad jokes. And okay, next slide. So the next we're talking about that here at studio, which Alan um, mentioned about building capacity, which was the original idea uh, with the workshop. So uh, next slide. So with Heritage Studio, it's more about it being uh, delivered online. So and with the digital attitudes and skills heritage survey, which was done during lockdown with the heritage funds, uh, pretty much right across the board, marketing and communications and creating content were the two highest needs uh, that the heritage sector saw that they needed uh, with digital skills, along with community engagement and strategy. So next slide. So it's basically the 3D workshops, but digital. And so being able to help those who want to get engaged and figuring out how to get engaged online by to start it in creative ways and within reach. So we started this ourselves by having hosting webinars, having toolkits online, which we had already developed within the project, but then more and more and more inviting other people to come in and collaborate. So it was a good discussion and help with K actually with Barbados Museum helping museum in the Western Highlands on their social media strategies. <laughs> so you never know where those connections can make and help can come from. It's not just linear, it can be from in every direction. Okay, next slide. Okay. Uh, yep. So, and then this is just talk. Yeah, like there you go. There's the webinar. So, and lots of people on having a discussion and being able to ask questions and be there, but just remotely. Next slide. All right. I think this is your part, Alan. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, if we if we just could go on to the next to the next slide. So the, the community, um, the Heritage Studio was great in terms of it, it, as an idea. It's, it's about. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry. It was about building capacity for for people to um, do the sort of heritage things that is necessary. Um, and a lot of the focus during during lockdown, um, I think, was on heritage at home. Like, how how can you actually make digital representations of heritage 
while you're at home and how can you access it um, access it from home and a lot of that focus um, took place through um, social media um, and a big response from museums um, and heritage organizations from social media with large numbers of people getting access getting access to it but not just social media also mapping solutions things like google maps provide a good platform and so on so if we and, and there's an example of um, being able to look at digital objects and being able to access them through a google google map um, platform and through that process actually reaching out to larger numbers of people to large numbers of people um, getting large numbers of people hitting on and, and look, looking at looking at these things um, and so the, the heritage at home can take place in the different forms so next slide that we talked about through social media um, accessing virtual reality um, through videos um, and also through um, online gaming platforms um, this being a digital reconstruction a peakish digital reconstruction and an interesting point here I think in, in terms of the relationship between traditional media and, and, and digital media so this is an example where you know a newspaper picks it up and advertises it and then large numbers of people are then able to access online um, things so I think that a lot of the time um, the debate may be posed in terms of well do we do it use this media or do we use that media and what's the advantage of this and what's the advantage of that I think it's more productive to think about how these things interact with each other in, in a positive in a positive way how traditional media and, and new media can um, combine together to both introduce new experiences and also um, to reinforce existing experience so we move on to the next um, slide um, but so the thing is that um, heritage at home became a critical and an important thing during the lockdown um, but um, as, as the lockdown is now beginning to ease and hopefully the easing will, will continue you know what happens with museums after the lockdown and this I think is a critical question and one of the things that we're really wanting to look at wanting to do is virtual reality um, digital technologies were previous to COVID were enhancing um, the digital experiences and adding new dimensions um, dimensions to them and I think there's a fear and there's a worry that um, that will kind of go away now because people won't want to touch things you won't want to put headsets on there's all of these sorts of issues and so I think the thing that we can look at and th this is what what has been said here leveraging smartphone technology to protect museum visitors we're really interested in the idea um, really echoing what we did at the talked about at the start of the talk um, of a, a local virtual museum where a digital device in the museum serves up content but it serves up content to people's own devices so that people can go into a museum with a smartphone and they get digital content from that museum not relying on the internet served up inside of the museum they get it onto their own device and that maintains security um, it's quite cost effective from the museum's perspective and it means that the safety issues don't really arise um, Catherine, did you do you want to chop in here? And and also, um, how much time do we? How far through our presentation are we? You 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 pretty much used up all the time so far, and we still have Kay to go with. So if you if you guys can maybe um, we'll wrap up. allow Kay to wrap up and then and then pass it on to Kay. Thank you. So much to say. Uh, well, I wanted to just mention with the the going back to the beginning a little bit was saying about uh, with all those uh, all that data with smartphone usage and smartphone availability is and uh, utilizing the capabilities and capacity of the community is here it is again at the end saying you know what can we do as we as museums start to open back you know what what is what is what is all this kind of um technology gonna gonna become do we just stop using it do we not is no let's innovate but let's use what people already have. And that's what you want to then go after and investigate and be innovative with is what can we do and what can we use so it's safe. And what's safe is using people's own devices and getting that content that you put a ton of work in or you built or other people have built but maybe it was on a different platform, put it, on, put it onto their phones in some way that's accessible within the museum and no matter where that museum is.
Was that your end, Alan? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, the, I, I think the big thing here is that community um, and museum, um, by trying to, by building capacity in museum and building connections between museums and communities in the digital domain, it provides a robustness um, which enables those dialogues to continue, for heritage to continue to be an important part of people's lives. When the national um, infrastructure and lockdown and disruption, while all of that takes place, a community museum focus really helps make sure that the technology um, remains relevant and effective in periods of crisis. Um, so yeah, um, it would be, be really great to hear from Kay now. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the Barbados Museum in particular has been using social media to reach out and maintain contact with our audiences post our COVID shutdown. Um, before COVID, we had a pretty active social media page with maybe about 4,000 members. And um, we also had a very, very active physical engagement program. We had a quite active um, calendar. We had lots of people in the museum at the time when COVID started, we were in the fat in the middle of this year's annual lecture series where we have people into the museum for weekly lectures on a particular topic. We also have our history group, our genealogy group, school tours, all sorts of stuff was happening. And then we went into lockdown. So just some statistics to start. Thank you, Jamie. Um, right now, this is a snapshot. That screen on your left is a snapshot of our engagement for the last month ending uh, two days ago when I did this presentation. As you can see, we have reached 67,694 people. Our page membership is actually significantly smaller than that. We have just over 5,000 likes. We have 5,805 people who like us and 6,344 people who follow us. Just to give you an idea of how high our engagement numbers are with regard to our, in, in um, contrast to our actual page membership. This has been because we've had a really, really active and a really vigorous social media campaign while we've been on lockdown. So. Our, pay, our post engagement, as you can see, over the last little while has actually been 8,663 persons, and that's actually a decline of 8% in the last week from our usual, but that just gives an idea of really what we're trying to do. Um, page views um, for the last week, 239, because it's been kind of a slow week. We had a really, really heavy, heavy month during June because it was both Windrush month and Heritage Month in Barbados, and we had a lot of content to push, so it's a slightly down number now. Um, next slide, please, Jamie. Right, and this is just to give you an idea of the types of things that we post. So I'm gonna start from, just like Alan and um, Catherine, I'm gonna start from before COVID. This is the type of post we ordinarily did before COVID. So these are, um, articles which are published from um, years ago. So um, you see like um, the dates are things like um, 1984 and, and back like that. What we do is we republish historical interesting stories. This um, is actually something called It So Happened, um, a feature article by a guy called Warren Allen and is very, very popular with our viewers. We've continued to do that. So as you can see, we sort of tailor it to what the audience is interested. So the one on the right is what we've been doing lately. And that one is actually um, a post on Pelican Island where we used to quarantine people during academics. So one of the things we do is link that content back to what people are interested in. But so starting with continuing with what we're doing, but we're also building on that. Next slide, please. And now we're gonna talk a little bit more about what we're doing now. So this is a little bit now based on our Enigma of Arrival exhibition, which came out of our EU lab project, which is where we became a partnership, we began to a partnership with you guys. Um, the slide on the left is actually um, a photograph straight out of the exhibition. And it talks about working conditions in Britain. Um, that's a post that we did. This, the, the, the right side of the slide is what we did to make it more interesting for our viewers. Basically, what you can do is to click a link attached to this photo and it gives you a jigsaw puzzle 
that you can complete after you've read a little bit about the Windrush history. And this kind of post has been very, very popular with our viewers. It's raised our engagement profile. It started out kind of slow. We actually thought people were not doing the puzzles. And then we started getting emails from people saying, we really love this stuff. And people, what we've been doing too, is um, we do a sort of a question and answer when we do the post. So we'll tell you a little bit of history and then we'll ask you, how that history links back to your life. Do you have similar experiences that you can share? And that in particular has been great with regard to getting people to interact with our page. So usually we've got lots of comments below, people are doing the puzzles, but we're basically getting a conversation going. And it is that conversation, I think, which has built both the interaction with our community as well as our engagement with our page and the numbers of persons who are responding. Next slide, please. The slide, the picture on the left, um, that is, a, again, another one of our features related to that exhibition. Um, we highlighted uh, 70 persons, one for each year leading up to that when Russia exhibition where the, ex where the um, exhibit was launched, um, who made significant contributions to either British or Caribbean society. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with British and Caribbean television, but that is actually um, the actor who played Desmond in the television series of the same name. And um, that post actually got thousands of views. Um, people were able to relate to a content that looked familiar. They were happy to see and hear the history behind it. They were engaged by the fact that he was a part of this same Win Rush generation. And again, these kind of features are the kinds of things that have been drawing people into the museum and getting them to interact with us. The one on the right, we call that our art history mystery. Um, we had an exhibition called the, um, the Black Presence, which is basically talking about the Black portraiture from um, a couple centuries ago. Um, and it looks at different alternate views where more, more um, unusual views of how black persons were viewed from the time of slavery. So you see views where they were displaying agency and so on, but not every piece of artwork displayed in the exhibition has a complete history. So what we've been doing is posting some of the pictures, some of the portraits, some of the artworks um, for which there are questions unanswered online and asking people what they think and can they help us solve that art history mystery. And again, lots and lots of engagement, tons and tons of people have weighed in and said what they think. And, and basically they've been very, very responsive to this type of interaction. Next one, please. And this is just to show you that we don't do everything on Facebook. Facebook is where we link to everything else, but our social media platforms actually respond to a variety of different things. What we did with our lecture series, with our history group, with a lot of our different social media things is that we went, our, our, our physical activities is that we went online. So um, what you're seeing there is a snapshot of our YouTube channel. Um, the little square boxes in orange are something we call the Museum Minute, where basically our tour guide um, visits a part of the museum and she gives you a little snapshot of a little piece of history in one minute flat. And people love it. Uh, they come on and we, we've got lots of favorable comments. We've also got a lunchtime lecture series going. We've also been reposting some of our lecture series from previous years. So um, for example, last year's lecture series on migration has been very popular because that's still very topical right now. Um, but what we will generally do is we put it on YouTube. We update everybody on Facebook to let them know that it's there. And we've been gradually building out our social media presence throughout the period. Next slide, please. Quick snapshots, um, on the left is Instagram, on the right is Twitter. Uh, once again, engaging different age groups, different activities. Um, what we've been doing too is a series of games and activities where people have to maybe pinpoint historical facts, unscramble words, uh, describe things in display cases. Again, very, very responsive. This is another one of those things that had started out kind of slow and we were beginning to think, hey, maybe people are not interested. And what we've realized over the last six weeks or so is that it's gradually been building. So we started out with like maybe 200 or so views and now we're batting seven or 800 for each of these kinds of posts. So we're really beginning to get some traction with these as people have gotten accustomed to the fact that we're offering a wider range of things for a wider variety of audiences. 
And basically, we, again, we link everything back to our Facebook so that there's a centralized way of controlling it. We all contribute to the content. So there are like seven or eight people in the museum designing different things for our Facebook page. But then one person controls the posting so that it isn't all crazy confusion. And we have a schedule. So for example, uh, next slide, please. Um, that's just a quick snapshot of our Tumblr. Um, next slide, please. Um, but basically, we, we've come to really, really understand that there are certain key things that we keep, we keep in mind. So for example, we know now that we, we, we have to listen to our audience feedback. We have to see what they're interested in. We've been very responsive to that. And we've gotten that build out in response to that. Our audience is really engaging with us. They're letting us know what they want. They're letting us know what they like. We're looking at our metrics and our numbers. The numbers do not lie. If only 10 people engaged in that post, that post was a dud. Um, however, that doesn't mean that you give up on an idea if it doesn't get traction immediately. Like I said, um, we didn't think anybody was doing the puzzles. And then we got we started getting emails of people, with people saying, yeah, we really, really like this one, or we will keep it up, keep doing this, because we were seeing people engaging with the historical content, but we weren't seeing people do the puzzles, and then suddenly they started emailing us about it. So it, the, 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 the feedback is not always immediately visible, so you don't give up right away, you monitor it. However, in the long run, those numbers do not lie. You have to remember it's a team effort. One person cannot engage an entire population on behalf of the museum. One person can't do all that content. It needs, it needs, it needs to be a team effort. I cannot stress this enough. Um, right now, our content is driven by myself and the education officer. We have three curators working on it. Our librarian is giving us content. Our tour guide is giving us content. And our audience is responding to that variety as well as the fact that we are putting enough out there to keep them engaged. It's not just like one post every couple of weeks or one post every couple of days. There's literally three or four different things that you can engage with within the space of 24 or 48 hours. That really, really keeps people engaged. They keep coming back. Um, if you post late, you will see that you've posted late. You will actually see a spike in the numbers if you post late because they've been waiting on that particular installment of the thing that they like. Don't, so don't go in with preconceived ideas about your audience as well. We've learned that if you have an idea, try it and see if it works. And your audience will let you know whether or not it's something that you can go with. Look at what's successful in audience engagement with other organizations. And if you see people, you see something that works for them, see if you can customize it for you. And that's not necessarily limited to museums. Of course, look at other museums, but sometimes it's other things as well. Some of our puzzles, for example, were taken from more commercial type sites, but they've also been very, very successful, customized to a museum type setting. And all of these things have come together to make what for us has been actually a quite successful community engagement. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, last night, I posted a post that I usually post around 10 a.m., quite late at 10.30. I think actually Alan did a screenshot of it a little earlier, the one with the penny farthing. And in 14 minutes, I had 70 views, one comment, and somebody had already done the puzzle. So that's just to give you an idea that your, your, your audience starts to depend on you. Um, I checked back on it just before we started this session and we were up to just under 700 people. So that engagement is there. People are looking for us. People are interacting with us and they really, really, really want that content that we're providing, particularly as their social options have become more limited within this space. They can't come out to the museum. They can't really go and do other things. Even though we've started to ease our lockdown, people are still a bit leery about socializing in those settings where they have to come into contact with other people, but they still have us. They still have the museum. We're still here for them. We're still engaging them with content. And that's my last slide, but just one last thing to leave you with. One of the, one of the projects we're doing right now, which we are hoping to really, really engage our community with. Uh, we have something called Our Stories, Our Museum. We are currently um, redesigning three of our core galleries, our children's gallery, um, our Jubilee gallery, which is our social history gallery, and our Harvard gallery, which is our natural history gallery. 
And what we have done is we have literally put out a public call to our community. You can in fact see it on our Facebook page. I'm sorry I didn't think to include it in my slides so you could see, but literally we have asked people to say to us, what kind of things do you want to see when you visit the museum and you revisit these spaces? What did you like from before that you'd like to keep? What did you think was missing that you now want to see? Help us to decide, help us to serve, help us to provide something for you that works for you. And we're very, very excited about that. We're also redesigning our website as a part of that. And I think I'm going to end there because I believe that we were over time before I started. Thank you. Um, I think it's my turn to thank, isn't it, uh, Jamie? Uh, thank you very much, um, Alan and Catherine and Kay. And uh, I should have said to start with, and forgive me for this, um, in case you haven't been to the previous ones, that we listen to all the ponencias, all the uh, presentations, and then we have uh, later at the end of the, towards the end of the seminar, webinar, uh, we will have questions. So if I may now move on to our next speaker, um, and may I just find something to um, introduce, uh, Claudio Nessi, um, who will, I believe, Claudio, speak in English this time. Yep, yep, yes. we're switching from English to Spanish. Uh, thank you, uh, Claudio, you could do it in Italian, we might just uh, follow. Uh, the Latin Americans will follow you roughly. But uh, let me see, um, Claudio Nessi is an interaction designer and community manager. Uh, he's the coordinator of the Eco Museo Casilino at Duas Lauros, a museum of the territory in the eastern suburbs of Rome. In the Eco Museum, he also takes care of research on contemporary art and is curator of several works of public art in the Open Air Street Art Museum of Torpignarata, one of the districts included in the Eco Museum. For years he has been consulting with other Italian Eco Museums. He's a member of the Italian collective that promotes the dissemination of public art in Italy and is a consultant to several Italian municipalities in the design of participatory processes. In recent years, he has specialized in eco-museum teaching at schools, universities, and research centers on material and immaterial cultural heritage. Uh, he's a member of the eco-museum network of Lazio. He will talk now to us about the role of new technologies in the processes of building communities in urban contexts characterized by social and cultural marginality, in particular during the lockdown of Italy. Why it was necessary to create a digital strategy and the impacts it had on local communities. He will then describe the individual tools developed highlighting the strengths and weaknesses in relation to the impact on the various local communities. Finally, he will highlight how this experience has actually opened up new scenarios in the museum practice of his institution. So welcome, bienvenido, uh, Claudio, um, over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much. As accordingly, Jamie, I will take uh, the control of the, of the screen uh, with my presentation. I hope you are seeing uh, the present my screen. Yes, we can. I, I go full screen. It's okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much to give me the opportunity to present our our museum and uh, our job during the Italian lockdown. And uh, first of all, I want to uh, give you a short uh, notes about uh, our museum. We are the promoter as an association 
of this museum, but we manage with uh, at least uh, uh, 400 of people uh, from association school, multicultural center, etc. Uh, we, we, we work uh, in the southeast uh, uh, suburbs of Rome. Mm, uh, part uh, really marginal, mm, it's, a, it's a part really, really marginalized in, in Rome. Uh, for, um, for uh, I think, uh, 10 years at least, it was considered the, the very uh, last part of uh, the city. And so this, uh, the, this problem, uh, this, this situation has created a lot of problems to the to different communities. And we uh, try to change this uh, the situation with our works. I give you some geographical uh, indication. You see uh, the, in the red, uh, the red shape indicates uh, the, the municipality of Rome. Uh, you see it, it comes from the very center of Rome to the very suburb of Rome and it's very very large and the population is a, is a population of a, a city of Porto in Portugal to give you an example. This is the area of our museum is a, a, is a 50 percent of uh, the, this territory is a very very large and uh, the, the same inhabitants of Zurich to give you uh, an example. In, you, we try to make this a museum because, uh, uh, because uh, um, the local communities feel that something was uh, changing very fast in their territory. The people are uh, starting to lose uh, their heritage because the situation of, of uh, marginalization allowed uh, a speculative project that, that, that are going to um, erase this heritage, both natural and cultural. So the Ecclesia respond to this predatory idea of uh, development, trying to enhance the local heritage, uh, using the local heritage uh, as a um, fuel for the new vision of uh, local development. Thanks to the great participation, we block, we totally stop the speculative project, and we, we start to, uh, to, to work to, of safeguarding self and enhancing the tangible and intangible heritage of this area. In these 10 years, uh, the Ecu Museum changed totally the narratives on the territory. Actually, the institution has recognized that this territory as uh, a territory of regional importance for the complex cultural heritage that it preserves. It's a regional law. After 10 years, we take a regional law. And actually, we are dealing with, with the municipality to make a new law to preserve all the area. So the everything is changing in these 10 years. The sense of belonging has, uh, has grown up and the people feel very embedded to their territory are not uh, are very ready included in their territory and the artistic archaeological historical and landscape heritage has become uh, a great uh, interest for tourists researchers and you no know, and so we have created a new uh, business model uh, in our uh, in our territory, and our territory actually is what is recognized that is of uh, one of the most interesting territory in Rome. But uh, talking about the pandemia, we we make some a lot of work during this uh, this time. During the lockdown, uh, um, our mission was to keep the relationship between the communities and their territory, a territory that is perceived as distant and regional. We decided to develop a digital solution to involve communities in three actions, recount, share, participate. With recount, we have organized the virtual exploration of the cultural heritage, and we have uh, at least uh, 1,000 participants uh, in the five uh, different uh, virtual tools. We organize virtual seminars, conferences about cultural heritage. We organize workshops for sharing tradition, always uh, in uh, via Zoom, Meet, and other digital solutions. We organize workshops for school, migrant communities, uh, elderly. We have organized a participation workshop for planning a urban space. Actually, we have uh, finished this uh, one of these uh, workshop uh, and uh, the municipality is uh, uh, starting the process to, to give a new name to a square. We have created digital tools to develop a participatory, participatory catalog uh, of the local heritage, Facebook group, storytelling platform, mapping platform, memories archives, a lot of things. 
Our challenge was to continue collecting narratives and making people feel part of the community because during the lockdown, the people uh, feel as individual, not part of community. We are reaching a new audience, elderly, disabled, frail people, and we have expanded the audience beyond the regional borders. How did it go? During the lockdown, we have uh, 30, 34,000 visitors. When I, when I talk about visitors, I talk about people that give us a donation, people that sing a form, okay? People that have decided to come to visit us. In, in uh, 2019, only 6,000. You see, it's a, it's a huge result. We, um, the people we are reaching during the lockdown via Facebook, YouTube, Instagram was uh, 325,000 people in, 90, in uh, 2019, 68,000. 90% of visitors come from uh, the Eco Museum neighborhoods. It means that uh, they find in us something, something important because they want to do something, they want to be part of something. We are supporting communities not to lose contact with their living space, their imagination, their memories, but it's not enough. We are, first of all, we are activists. So we need to do something with the community, for the community. We need to act for the community. That's the reason why we have created direct, direct support tools, economic, psychological, educational. We support food aid campaign through communication plan and direct participation of the, activity, um, the activities. We support families with a psychological counseling services. We have created a ter alternative teaching project to support school and children. In Italy, schools have been closed for almost six months. Beyond pandemia, all these things uh, give us lessons and uh, critical issues and opportunities. We must rethink ourselves because everything has changed, totally has changed. We must assume that in next month, it will be impossible to have behaviors as in the pre-COVID period. We need to increase the usage of digital tools and solutions. Of course, they are effective and allow us to reach more people, but they cannot replace activities and increase the digital gap in communities. So we have to find a way to do something live with the people. We need to redesign our process and procedures because we must prevent the effect of the second uh, pandemic uh, situation because we have no guarantees for the future. We must deeply think our role in the community because we must uh, concretely support communities because it is unimaginable to start over doing usual things, research, exhibition, etc. Everything is changing. The community needs us to do something for, uh, for them. We must be more than a museum or probably we must be the real museum. We must become a social center, kindergarten, school, psychological support center, the food diet center. We must be the center of the community. We, we, we have to reimagine ourselves as the center of the community. There's a lot of work to do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Claudio, for that really interesting um, uh, intervention. I'm really glad to hear that um, so many people think that the museum needs to be at the center, at the heart of their community. And it's wonderful to see how um, it's being done and it can, and it's possible. So this is really wonderful news and I, I really appreciate um, your, the information you've shared with us. We are now gonna move on to our final presentation for today, which is another group presentation. Um, by two of the members of the EU LAC project. Uh, so this is going to be done by Mario Antas and Jamie Brown. So I will present each of them in turn. Hol uh, Mario Antas holds a PhD in museology um, with expertise in educational communication in museums. Currently he works at the National Museum of Archaeology in Lisbon, Portugal. He was also a board member of ICOM Portugal from 2016 to 2020 and European coordinator of ICOM SECA, um, the Committee of Education and Cultural Action from 2016 to 2019. He has been an invited expert for several seminars of the Council of Europe, History Education Unit, General Directorate 2, and the Democratic Citizenship and Partnership uh, and Participation, excuse me, um, and Education Department, the Council of Europe and for several European, um, other European projects. He was the Portuguese team coordinator in the European project financed by the EU Culture Program and Eurovision Museums Exhibiting Europe. 
Currently, he is the principal researcher and team coordinator of the National Museum of Archaeology, ULAC project, which is, as we all know, co-financed by, by the European Union. Um, and he um, is also a consultant and member of the executive committee of the COSMOS, the Community School of um, Museum Project, Erasmus um, Plus project. That's from 2018 to 2021. He teaches museums and education in the Department of Museology and the Museology Department at the University of Humanities and Technologies in Lisbon. So thank you, Mario. Mario and I will present now also uh, Jamie. Jamie, as many of you have been watching, um, and seeing he is our main administrator for the project for the EU LAC project, but he's also the project and um, he's also the program. Um, he leads the youth program uh, project for the European Union for this project, excuse me, for the EU LAC museums and communities project. Um, he graduated with an undergraduate bachelor degree in community education at the University of Strathclyde in Scotland, followed by a diploma in European studies at the University of Vienna in Austria, and finally graduated from the University of St. Andrews, Scotland in 2011 with a postgraduate um, MLIT in museum and gallery studies. He joined the Museums, Galleries and Con Collections Institute in the School of Art History of University of St. Andrews, Scotland in 2016. His experience includes project management, community empowerment and participation, coordinating youth programs and securing funding for diverse community volunteer projects across Scotland and internationally. In collaboration with local partners, he's led the bi-regional youth exchange program between Costa Rica, Portugal and Scotland for the EU LAC Museums project. And he um, has overseen the project's social media channels in partnership with the Museo Nacional de Arqueología in Lisbon, Portugal with Mario. He will present um, EU LAC Museums progress of disseminating the project research during COVID-19 pandemic via social media. So thank you, Mario. Thank you, Jamie. Welcome to the webinar. Um, thank you, Lauren. Um, good afternoon for uh, everybody. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here and share uh, the ideas with uh, colleagues all around the world. Since United States, Canada, Canada, uh, Pakistan, India, uh, Yemen, uh, lots of European countries and also African countries. So it's uh, and South America countries. It's a pleasure. Hola a todos, es un placer eh, estar aquí eh, con vosotros y tener la oportunidad de compartir las ideas eh, con colegas del mundo entero, de América del Norte, América del Sur, eh, de Europa, África y de Asia. Uh, now I will present uh, this in English. Okay, um, uh, my presentation um, is trying to make uh, some point of situation uh, in community museums in Portugal. Uh, so, um, uh, as everybody knows, this pandemic crisis affects all uh, the people uh, uh, in the world, all the countries, and um, the museums were closed for several times. In Portugal, um, we have been closed from 19 of March and the museums start to reopen in 18 of May, the International Day of Museums. Um, so we are talking about a situation of two, two months of closing um, the museum. Uh, so the questions they are trying to resume here is what happened to the museums when they are closed, especially the community museums, and what happened when the museums uh, reopen? Okay, so um, I will try to now make a panorama of news of community museums in Portugal. But um, first, uh, just to summarize, um, of course, that we may know, and everybody was listening the previous um, participants in the in this webinar. Uh, the reinforcement of digital communication uh, happen, uh, especially in social media, when several museums and community museums um, um, make new things and new content uh, for the, the publics. Uh, we are talking not only to post uh, objects, but uh, share some videos, uh, live streamings, 
inside the museums um, uh, to show that uh, uh, from the directors, quiz, games, so a huge range of different things that museums uh, uh, made during this period. Of course, the museums also produce new content uh, uh, for uh, sharing with, uh, uh, with their publics and uh, new tools that we spoke before, uh, not only in 3D, but uh, virtual exhibitions and some of them uh, apps, um, for instance. So next slide, please. Um, of course, that uh, we must focus in some numbers. Uh, in, the, in the last weeks, NEMO, Network of European Museums Organizations, um, made a study for European museums, and they show that 60% of museums increase their online presence. And uh, I think that, uh, that this fact uh, um, happened uh, in the rest of the world, of course. Uh, and there are some conclusions that, that I'm quoting. Um, the, the importance of social media, the importance of uh, what we call uh, virtual museums, uh, and, and especially uh, as uh, St. Andrew's uh, digital team, 3D team, uh, focus, the importance that uh, how digital presence uh, is an opportunity uh, for promoting the sustainability in community museums. And okay, in this side, the uh, next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to show you several museums uh, in Portugal and several experience uh, to share with you. In the, in the north of Portugal, uh, we have uh, a root, a root of Romanesque is uh, an artistic style um, in, the, in the European countries. Um, and uh, this root is especially um, uh, to promote heritage uh, in several um, cities and places in the north of Portugal. And uh, of course, they just to, uh, to show that they, they won uh, the, the prize of European Heritage Day Stories 2000, uh, 2020. So what is important in this online experience? Next slide, please. The, uh, this online experience promotes several places, for instance, uh, museums or interpretation centers and show, show it in virtual tours, but also monuments, as you can see on the right side of your screen, that we have a church and this is possible to visit and go inside in a virtual way. So it's an interesting way to show and to show the and to promote local heritage because many of the times that is uh, heritage is unknown uh, even for the Portuguese. Uh, and this is a good uh, tool to rediscover the country and uh, to promote um, the heritage in the very clever way and especially to uh, combat the isolation of people that are in at home and cannot visit uh, physical anything during these two months, okay? Next slide, please. Now uh, I'm going to the center of Portugal when a museum is a museum of a, a council a community in center of Portugal, uh, reinforce of course the online experience. Uh, uh, here in Portuguese is written, uh, discover the museum at home and is the image of a old telephone and the innovation here that uh, in this period, um, they were able to uh, reinforce not only the presence online, but new tools. For instance, they add content in Portuguese sign language, you can see on the right side of the screen, and also audio description, uh, and is available on the websites uh, of this museum. Uh, so uh, this period is also an opportunity for the museums to reinvent themselves in the ways of communication, because a museum that does not communicate does not exist. Uh, so um, 
communication plays a great role uh, in the museums. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to focus in two particular uh, case studies that for me are very, very important. The first one is a, a small museum um, in the south of Portugal in São Brás do Portel. It's a custom museum, but this museum is actually the core of the community. Uh, is an uh, eco museum, is a community museum as well. And uh, in my uh, opinion, this, museums, uh, this museum um, is very near the, the concept that in ICOM, uh, in the last meeting of Kyoto in Japan, um, was the, the motto. This museum is a cultural hub, is a cultural hub for the community. So uh, next slide, please. OK. Uh, this museum promotes a lot of initiatives for uh, the community and the local community is uh, a small community of uh, 5,000 in inhabitants. Um, so um, this community has uh, some problems that we are going to share now and uh, see what was the answer in this pandemic crisis that this museum and this museum uh, show, and it is very interesting. So next slide, please. Uh, they put, uh, this is the website of, of the museum, um, and they they put a, a huge uh, highlight, uh, what we call it suspended time in COVID-19 pandemic crisis. Next slide, please. And like, let's look closer. So we have uh, this menu, and they, in this menu with several buttons, uh, they put uh, several buttons about the world situation in COVID. What happens in the world during the COVID? Statistics, uh, where is this pandemic crisis? Number of deaths, et cetera, et cetera. Then the situation in Portugal, or, uh, the situation of crisis in Portugal in COVID-19, and then the region in Algarve region, where is this museum um, in, is. And in the second part, they show, and this is very interesting, this uh, website is an aggregator of information, not only about the COVID and pandemic crisis, but also uh, about the museums in the world, virtual museums and virtual exhibitions around the world. And another part that uh, is more concerned with community and uh, how community uh, can help in this situation. So uh, I will try to, do, to detail a little more. Next slide, please. So um, about virtual museums and virtual exhibitions, there is a direct link on this uh, website of this museum to uh, 25 virtual museums that you can see at home. Uh, uh, these 25 museums are Portuguese museums, like Lubenkian Museum, uh, very famous, and the National Coach Museum, also very famous because of the collection, and among other museums. Next slide, please. But also, uh, have direct links for, for instance, virtual tours in 3D, for World Heritage Monuments since India uh, to Thailand, uh, to, to France, Italy, uh, Brazil, Colombia, United States. So it's very open and very interesting how they can make this like an aggregator. Um, uh, and also they share the museums in virtual worlds with another uh, research uh, gates uh, and of course, that experience there is, there, there is in, in Instagram, the COVID art museum, where people put something connected with COVID and you can see several photos on the right, uh, persons with using masks uh, in monuments and uh, sharing their own art during this period as well. Next slide, please. 
And of course, the museum uh, have a, a new ex uh, have an exhibition called Wheels of Time. Um, it's an exhibition about the first years of 20th century, and they share it online. Uh, for instance, they have a part uh, of uh, the, the crazy uh, years, 20 years uh, uh, in the beginning of century and about the First World War. Uh, so uh, they, they put it a uh, physical exhibition online as well. Uh, next slide, please. But something very interesting in this uh, uh, website is the social intervention. So how uh, this situation is affecting us uh, and how we can connect with real people, with real communities. And the museum in this fact play a, a big role. So the, um, I translated, uh, so they have a link to a portal and they, with several buttons, uh, I need help. When people uh, put and click and send a message, I need food for my, my kids because I'm an unemployed, so I need it. And the other button, I want to help. For instance, I can share, um, uh, I have a, a room available for people that lost homes or I can uh, buy uh, medical care for someone. And of course, another, another part for helping our heroes uh, and our heroes are the doctors and the persons connected with the security forces as well, but especially the medics and nurses. Uh, so uh, the, in, this is uh, how this museum uh, could uh, shift and put uh, these websites in service of the community, providing not only information about museums and cultural monuments, but also uh, about the reality of this pandemic crisis and how to help or being helped. Um, and uh, I think this is a very important point that um, uh, internet brings us and can we share uh, about uh, this. Next slide, please. Um, okay, uh, to finalize this uh, case study, just to say uh, that the museums, uh, th this museum um, have a, a lot of activities. And for instance, for instance, the study group of local memory through photo uh, photographies uh, did not stop. It was in presence in the museum, but during the, the, the lockdown, uh, they use Zoom like we are using now for this webinar. Uh, and after they reopen, uh, the museum starts slowly to reopen activities. For instance, physical exercise in the garden, in museum's gardeners for the older persons. And uh, the museum as a center uh, as a core of the community um, and, uh, among, uh, and among other activities. For instance, one very interesting, uh, the unemployment uh, rise very much uh, in Portugal. So the museum um, and have a lot of space and promote the creation of a workshop for persons uh, unemployed to produce masks. Uh, and they are creating employment, and these masks were sold for the for uh, for around Portugal for um, um, uh, for the community. <laughs> um, another important thing that uh, uh, the museum have uh, have cars, and in, in this point, the museum are uh, helping the older persons. For instance, taking persons to the supermarket to buy things. Uh, and this is very interesting uh, how the museum play, uh, play a key role in the, in the society and in these communities and how the museum can be a central institution uh, to help the communities. Okay, next slide, please. Now I'm going to talk about the second uh, case study that I bring here is the Museum of, Porti of Portimao. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a museum uh, connected with the canning factory, uh, sorry, with the, uh, with the fisher, with the fishermen. 
and the, pro yep. the process. Can I of interrupt you a quick second? If you can make this one a little bit briefer, that would be yeah. great because we're okay. over time. So thank I'm going you. to speed up. Okay, thank you. Sorry, thank I, I talk too much. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so ne next slide. Um, so next slide, please. Okay. Uh, despite the fact they they have to close doors, they promote it. Uh, they 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 can answer in the digital way, and they create several tools. Uh, to maintain this link to the community. Um, next slide, please. Okay, they have a lot of activities. They, we have the link here, and uh, they promoted Museum at Home. And uh, this Museum at Home uh, have uh, two parts. One, to promote uh, a virtual visit of free, uh, 360 degrees, and a multi a multi guide language in uh, multi guide, uh, sorry, multimedia guide in five language, uh, in order to try to maintain the dialogue and uh, the, uh, and uh, to promote the collections. Uh, next slide, please. As you can see here, they have in five language: Portuguese, Spanish, German, English, and French. And uh, is a lot of interesting. Uh, uh, information about this museum. Next slide, please. And of course, the other part to bring museum at home that it is um, possible for persons, kids from schools, uh, because kids could not more go to the schools this school year in Portugal to have the connection with the museum. And it was possible for kids to show their works at home and to share uh, things like to, how to make a cake or uh, uh, how, how, how they miss the museum or the, how, the, the, how they reinterpret the uh, museum objects. So it's a very interactive way uh, that this museum uh, found to communicate with persons. Next slide, please. And uh, of course, uh, when the museum reopened 18 of May, and they reopen, and by promoting a new initiative, it was uh, a photographic race. What does this, is, this is mean? It, it was a, a, a contest about photos in COVID-19 period, in pandemic crisis. Uh, it was launched in 22 of May, and uh, uh, this will be an exhibition in the museum uh, that the museum promotes for not to lose the memory of these times because museums are all about memory and about history as, and we know that history sometimes repeats and we have to have these memories as well. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, um, that this is really important to achieve the community and to uh, not break the links with the communities. So it's important the, the, the role that museums played and the important how the museums uh, interact and react to this pandemic. Next slide, please. And for finishing, uh, I would to put some question for our reflection. Uh, next time, please. So this is a graphic uh, uh, about search trends on Google between 7th of July of uh, 2019 and 5th of July 2020. And as we can see in these categories, there was uh, um, in pandemic crisis, the change of, of uh, ser uh, searches and researchers on Google, for instance, people start to uh, ask more for a virtual, a virtual museum, virtual trips, uh, for instance. And we saw that museum near me, for instance, decrease a lot, and to visit a museum decrease a lot. So um, also, uh, we can, if you add time, we don't have time for this, but if you look closer to these graphics, uh, we are not now in position to evaluate the impact of COVID-19 in the museums. 
but we have uh, some data available right now uh, to see that was something was different uh, when we look to this big data uh, around the world. And uh, this is for sharing with colleagues because this, for me, it's very interesting. So I'm going to finish because I speak too much. Thank you for your attention. And it was a pleasure uh, to share uh, the ideas about the Portuguese response of community museums in Portugal to this pandemic crisis. Thank you very much. Muitas gracias. Thank you, Mario. On to Jamie, please. Jamie. Thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you, Mario, as well. Um, firstly, hello, everyone, again. Um, I'm now going to discuss how the EU LAC Museums project has dealt with the COVID-19 pandemic through social media and how we have utilised this opportunity to really increase our um, profile and raise our awareness of project research and major outputs. We aim to tackle this through three ways. We wanted to build on the success of increasing our social media followers across all our platforms, but crucially Facebook. We wanted to tailor social media posts celebrating international days and develop a strategy communication and dissemination plan to take the project into its final stage for completion by January 2021. All of this, as Kay mentioned earlier, all of this information, all of these uh, possibilities of increasing our social media has been a collective effort across our consortium from research assistants right up to our principal investigators. As you can see from our dramatic figures, on the 28th of March, just before lockdown and the pandemic really happened here in, in Scotland, we had, an in, we had a like number of 1,331 likes. Now, on today, on the 10th of July, we have a staggering 10,684 likes. So that is a dramatic increase of 702%. How did we actually do this at EU LAC Museums? Well, we targeted photographs of researchers through posts, we, used, we posted on our Facebook page in a variety of languages, including English, Spanish and Portuguese. We used emojis, so simple things like smiley faces, European flags, the flags of the countries of the research, tips and thumbs up as a way of creating more emotion in our posts. And finally, we created Facebook events, including streaming services such as this very webinar that you're taking part today. In addition, we celebrated International United Nations and European Union recognised days, such as the Biodiversity Day, where we showcase photographs from across our consortium's research. The photograph on the left of the screen is a photograph from nature in Barbados in the Caribbean. We shared project articles, research from, for example, the Virtual Museum and art and published articles from um, open access sources. We also reshared from other Facebook pages, such as the Peru television channel. And finally, we also used made use of the new Facebook feature cover stories for sharing research videos and quite unique and photographic images to showcase our research and, of course, links from other projects and other Facebook pages, such as ICOM. We also have held premiere video screening, whereby we encourage participants and those who like the Facebook page to watch certain videos from our um, YouTube channel. We've been promoting the 3D scans of objects from our 3D team across our consortium. And again, we've been for, uh, we have been premiering our video documentary about the EU LAC Museum project, which was one of the most successful posts on our Facebook page. In addition, we also have targeted specific areas such as the English-speaking Caribbean, the Spanish-speaking countries of Latin America, and the Portuguese-speaking South American countries, as well as English-speaking European and French-speaking and German-speaking countries in Europe. This has increased our likes dramatically, as you can see, as earlier I mentioned about the 700% increase. So here, let's have a look at the statistics. The total reach of our Facebook page direct yesterday was a staggering half a million people, with the top 10 countries on our Facebook page being Venezuela, Argentina, Bolivia, Peru, Mexico, Nepal, Algeria, India, Brazil and the Philippines. We also have resulted since March this year of a staggering 63,000 63 posting engagements, 
So that's people liking, reacting and sharing our posts. In addition, our YouTube channel now has 55 videos listed with over 10 and a half, sorry, 10,800 views. And this equals to a staggering 30 million minutes worth of watched videos. We've also been supported by the UNESCO agency ICOM for dis disseminating our research from January 2019 to this June 2020. Through their social media channels, in particular Facebook, they have reached 15,500 in just relation to our EU Light Museums projects and over 26,000 impressions on Twitter. As you can see, these figures are staggering and we are delighted as a project and as a consortium to be able to reach a wider and more broad audience across Europe, Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as across the globe. Thank you so much for listening today and thank you. Thank you, Jamie. I am delighted to see those numbers. <laughs> so that is really, really quite impressive. Um, it's been a ton of work on every everybody's side, uh, but definitely you, Jamie, have been working on this arduously. So congratulations to you in particular and to everybody in the ELAC um, team. So, um, and thank you, Mario, for your very interesting um, talk, uh, talk on what they're doing in Portugal. I found that extremely interesting to have a, a click. You could click on it and say, I need help or I want to help. So that's really an amazing way that we can see the museums really can be a part of their society and their community. Um, so I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers. Muchísimas gracias a todos los ponentes de hoy. It has been a true pleasure to have all of you participating. And um, based on the comments that we've been getting from all of our um, listeners today, they've been really appreciative. Um, so thank you. Muchísimas gracias a todos nuevamente por participar. Los comentarios que hemos recibido son tales que nos da la impresión que la información que han compartido ha sido sumamente de suma valor, de sumo valor para todos los participantes. So thank you to everybody once again. I did want to um, mention briefly that we have at least 30 countries here participating today. Um, Albania, Argentina, Bangladesh, Bolivia, Brazil, Canada, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Egypt, England, Guatemala, Haiti, India, Japan, Mexico, Pakistan, Peru, Philippines, Poland, Portugal, Puerto Rico, Russia, Scotland, Spain, Thailand, Tunisia, United States, and Yemen. So thank you so very much to everybody um, who is participating as well um, within this Zoom seminar. We are gonna move on now to the questions and answers period. Um, we've received various questions and I'm gonna to try to consolidate them to a certain extent. Um, I do wanna begin though with uh, Ben Fast's question, who, uh, Ben, thank you so much for your very positive feedback that we've been receiving from you uh, from Canada. And Ben asks, uh, this isn't in particular, this isn't to one of the speakers in particular, so I open the floor to any of you who wish to respond. Um, and, I think, let me just briefly mention that we've turned off the subtitles. So Anna is gonna be helping me with the, helping with the translation. Um, Anna nos va a estar ayudando porque hemos eliminado por ahora los subtítulos. Entonces Anna nos va a estar ayudando con la traducción simultánea. With that said, I ask that the, the respondents please uh, every so often give her a chance to be able to, to um, translate. So Ben's question. Are the initiatives, tech ideas, infrastructures, and changes in approaches researched or promoted in these projects being applied to or shared with museums in Europe? Ben seems to have a particular interest in seeing what has been transferred over to Europe that's being developed so widely um, in Latin America. Is there, and this is, I think, a question that many people have raised, not only in this webinar, but in other webinars. Is there funding available on either side of the ocean instituting these opportunities of uh, the tech, specifically technological advances? Um, so he says that he's seeing similar needs in the small museums in Canada, where the response is often that there's not enough funding or capacity to do the digital work. Uh, let alone the awareness or the knowledge. So this has been a big problem throughout this whole time. And there have been institutions and museum professionals that have taken it upon themselves to learn really quickly how to do all of this. But then there's many who say, we just can't, we don't have the money, we don't know how. And so they get frustrated um, with that. So do any of you have anything that you might wish to respond regarding um, the any initiatives or any funding or any 
um, possibilities to help museum professionals um, build on their infrastructure, their technological and virtual infrastructure. Alan, please. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I know that digital projects, you know, in, in the past have been sometimes very expensive and, and often like sinks for money just kind of going into it and, you know, not a lot coming, coming out or, or very, you know, flash prestigious projects that may be appropriate for um, national museums in a, in, a, in a capital city, but um, seem kind of like out of reach beyond that. And I, I think I would say that the, the approach that the EU LAC project has tried to take has been to leverage on the um, skills that exist already inside of communities. I mean, we, we did a workshop in Seychelles um, and one of the things that was clear about that was that there were a number of people came along to the workshop who were skilled, if not professional um, photographers. And so to then take that skill that's in that community and turn it into being able to do photogrammetry or to work with 360 images isn't, isn't a huge step. So I think that it's like starting from what resources already exist and then trying to build capacity beyond that. Similarly, the, the sort of equipment that we're talking about um, the, for the local virtual museum, we're talking about investing in a computer that costs somewhere between 50 and 200 pounds to be able to serve up content to, um, you know, in a room to, to people who come in with their mobile phones. Now that's not, you know, a huge amount of money. Alan, um, give us one second just so that Anna can translate. Thank you. Sí, um, habla sobre cómo proyectos digitales han sido en el pasado a lo mejor demasiado caros y aplican para um, museos prestigiosos o pueden ser relevantes para museos nacionales, pero parecen inaccesibles en otros contextos. Entonces, la estrategia de EULAC ha sido utilizar los recursos y las habilidades que ya existen en las comunidades. Por ejemplo, eh, se refiere a um, las Seychelles, donde había ya eh, foto gente que sabía y con buenos fotógrafos. Entonces, EULAC permite construir a partir de esos recursos y habilidades. Y también comenta que el equipo que ellos... Eh, proponen para los museos locales puede costar entre 50 y 200 libras una computadora que no es eh, tantísimo dinero. Um, there, there isn't, as far as I know, a, you know, a, a big fund that we can just do the stuff for, but there are ways of applying for money and, 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 and to get money to set projects up to do this. And I do think the sort of combination of community museum and bring your own device is really a, a challenge that that needs to be met and it needs to be met in the near you know future and it's one that can make a huge difference to um, museums um, and to cultural heritage and I think now's the time to really be looking at that sort of um, technology and that sort of um, innovation and and um, I'm, I'm sure it's something that we will we will see happening. Um, hay formas de aplicar a uh, fondos y um, la idea de combinar el museo comunitario con eh, la idea de traer eh, los propios dispositivos de, o utilizar los propios dispositivos de los, del público, de los usuarios, eh, puede hacer una gran diferencia y este es el momento de utilizar esa tecnología y esa innovación. Thank you. I'm not sure if anybody else would like to respond to that question before we move on to the next. Mario, did you want yes. to say something? Yes. Um, uh, thank you for the, the question. Um, uh, I think that um, uh, in, in, in this world and uh, what is happening, not only in pandemic crisis, uh, we have to think in several options. Um, First, uh, we, we have the museums and the communities. In my opinion, nothing uh, substitutes the unique experience to see an object in the museum. 
but we can use all, and I am totally in favor of uh, digital, uh, um, digital resources, but in my opinion, these virtual tours, as Alan said, as Catherine said, uh, they are helping uh, persons to approach persons not only to the museums but to the communities because in, in these days uh, everybody have a mo mobile phone and uh, is very fast and uh, uh, it comes in our life day life to use our phone to communicate there are thousands of uh, social media networks since uh, uh, TikTok, uh, uh, facebook uh, instagram twitter and so on uh, that uh, allow us to communicate. And in my opinion, museums should uh, use this. And other question is, my point is, technology is very important to approach people and communities as well uh, in this sense. And about uh, uh, financial issues for these projects, I think Alan said, there is of course an initial, uh, initial uh, uh, investment, financial investment, but um, it's not a, a, a big investment. Um, and uh, uh, I think we must more focus in the, on the results. For instance, this project, you like museums and 3D team and uh, all the, the teams gave opportunity for the heritage of remote communities and remote uh, community museums um, to enhance the objects and their own memory in the broader way. And I think is one of the biggest results of this community because allow people allows people from every part, every part of the world to see, look, this object in a remote uh, community in Costa Rica, and we have a similar in my country, in Portugal, in Spain, and this is uh, uh, what we gain and this is uh, uh, what we achieve to establish links because we have the common, uh, the, the common origin and we have uh, the goal to um, make together uh, Europeans, uh, people from Caribbean uh, and, especially, and from uh, South America and this project brings us this answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. En, 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 Perdón, Ana. Sí. En, en este mundo, dice, y no solo se refiere a la pandemia, sino que hay que ver varias opciones eh, de museos y comunidades. Y nada sustituye la experiencia de ver un objeto en el museo físicamente. Pero las herramientas virtuales ayudan a la gente a acercarse no solamente a los museos, sino a las comunidades. Y hay mucha gente, la mayoría de la gente tiene, cuenta con un celular, es muy común el uso de redes sociales y los museos deben utilizar estas plataformas. Eh, la tecnología es importante en este sentido y en términos económicos no necesita una gran inversión, sino que hay que enfocarnos mejor en los resultados. Por ejemplo, el, en el proyecto de 3D, que es parte de EULAC, eh, que dio la oportunidad a comunidades remotas de compartir sus objetos, por ejemplo, desde Costa Rica hacia todo el mundo, y es una forma de crear este tipo de conexiones. Genial, gracias, Ana. Thank you, Mario, for your responses, and Alan, as well. Um, perhaps feeding off the same topic, um, we wanted to shoot the question over to Julián, um, and also to all of you um, who are participating, specifically regarding uh, smartphones and the use of smartphones. Um, one of the questions that we received is whether or not this, the, the applications discussed um, and the programs discussed is only within the museum setting or if that's something outside of the museum setting as well. And um, if there's any limitations that you have found um, specifically within the region. Um, so perhaps Julian or Kay can also address it from the uh, lack side of the sea. Sí, eh, pues sin duda la mayor preocupación que tenemos en, en, pues en Colombia, yo trabajo para el Ministerio de Cultura de Colombia y es eh, una de las primeras cosas que detectamos es la falta de infraestructura, sin duda, no, no toda la gente en países en Latinoamérica tienen el acceso pues, a estos eh, dispositivos tecnológicos. 
pero digamos que si lo, si lo, si lo vemos en comparación con otros años, eh, estamos en un momento en que muchísima gente, ya la mayoría de la gente puede tener acceso a, a tecnologías digitales. Eh, a mí lo que me preocupa muchísimo eh, en Latinoamérica es que hay como una idea de que hay que hacer museos con muchísima tecnología, construir museos extremadamente tecnológicos en sus exposiciones y que creo que eso ha causado una crisis muy fuerte eh, en ciertos museos en Colombia en particular, porque es, es, empezamos a hablar de, de, un, de unos problemas ya de sostenibilidad a futuro. Entonces creo que esta idea que se ha estado pues, eh, compartiendo muchísimo en el chat de traiga usted mismo su propio dispositivo y el museo de lo que se encarga es seguramente de crear eh, tal vez eh, el ambiente para poder tener eh, acceso tecnológico, es decir, la infraestructura básica para garantizar de pronto internet o una red 4G cercana de telefonía celular para utilizar a través de smartphone. Ese tipo de, de tecnologías yo creo que es las, las que debería estar abogando los museos comunitarios en relación con los proyectos gubernamentales. Pero no más, yo sí creo que no más no podemos seguir pidiendo museos eh, con dispositivos ultra tecnológicos que nos van a causar problemas a futuro porque todos sabemos la tecnología eh, eh, pues se eh, pasa de moda muy rápidamente. Um, the main concern, uh, he works at the Ministry of Culture in Colombia, and his main concern is the lack of infrastructure and the lack of access to devices. Although most people uh, in Colombia do have access to digital technologies, but his concern is this idea in Latin America about building high tech museums. And in Colombia, this would create problems of sustainability in the long term. So uh, this idea of bringing your own device uh, is very good so that museums would only need to provide basic infrastructure. So he favors this kind of, um, of technology uh, for community museums uh, in relation to government projects, because we know that technology will keep changing and will need to uh, keep being updated. Kay, did you want to respond as well? Um, this is more from an end user's perspective for us. In Barbados, we have, um, I think the statistic is 1.4 mobile phones per adult. <laughs> so we have a fairly heavy saturation of mobile phones in the market. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that, every, uh, that everyone has access. For example, um, we'd started doing school online in March and there was a definite lack of devices for school kids to be able to access online school. People had to be donating them, stuff like that. So when we are doing our content, we try to be mindful that people are accessing it with perhaps a mixture of devices. Uh, we try to make sure that any visual content can be viewed on a relatively large screen like a laptop, but also still on a very small mobile phone. Um, from our point of view, um, technology wise, When we started, we started with the scrappiest of things. Like when we did our very first live stream, we used my personal mobile and we were like, we're trying a thing. If it don't work, we'll apologize to the public afterwards. Right now we have dedicated equipment. We have a laptop. Um, we have more than one camera. We've partnered with somebody who was, was interested in helping us put that content out. So we've gradually gotten more professional as we've, we've gone forward. But even when we were at our most unprofessional, people appreciated the content. So I would say whatever technology people can access, use it. But don't forget the people who don't have access. Um, habla desde la experiencia de Barbados, donde las estadísticas dicen que hay 1.4 celulares por adulto. Entonces hay una saturación de dispositivos pero esto no significa que todos tengan acceso. Por ejemplo, en las últimas eh, semanas o meses en que la escuela fue en línea, sí se notó una falta de dispositivos. Entonces hay que tener esto en cuenta para el diseño de contenido que funcione en diferentes tipos y tamaños de pantallas. 
ellos empezaron en el museo a transmitir en vivo utilizando sus propios dispositivos personales y ahora cuentan con un poco más de equipo. Pero hay que enfocarse en el, con en el contenido y no olvidar a aquellos que quizá no tengan acceso. Gracias, Ana. Thank you, Kay. Thank you, Julian. Um, if anybody else wants to chime in about it as well, um, please feel free. But we do want to address another question that was uh, slightly addressed um, by Kay in her response. So, Kay, if you want to add anything to this. Um, this is a question that was first posed by Emma Jackson, who also has been a really um, active participant of our webinar series. So thank you, Emma, for for being here always with us and all these positive remarks that you pose and questions that you've been posing. Um, her specific question is, how do community museums approach targeted digital engagement with schools and their students around the world? Uh, do you engage in reciprocal tailored com conversations as you plan your content? So a little bit of that, you know, how do, how do they approach the schools um, and that uh, sector of their public and also this a similar question was posed um by sorry i'm looking for by maria patricia um mentioning that in argentina also the the difficulty is that many and and maybe claudio can help discuss this in relation to the eco museum and, and community museum model of you know what do we do now that so many museums are virtually at, or the communities are isolated from their museum. And so it's the same, the same applies for, for school children who can't attend the museum. So I don't know if you, if you have anything that you'd like to add in relation to this. Mm. I, I, I can talk about the, the Italian situation because in, in Italy, the, the students uh, have a program of a virtual classroom. So all the students stay at home and uh, the teachers stay at their home and use the, the internet and uh, all the Zoom and uh, other uh, platform to communicate and make, uh, make the lessons. So we ask to the uh, principal of all the, the school of uh, our territory to uh, give us the opportunity to have half an hour uh, for a week to make uh, something that integrates the, the normal the normal activity at school. And we plan with the kids uh, some virtual tools uh, and virtual mapping uh, and something like this, some digital tools uh, in order to, to make something else, okay? And uh, the kids was very, very, very happy about this. We, I think we, we have reached 200, uh, students uh, in uh, only two districts. And uh, actually I can say that uh, this is something uh, we can put in plan, we can to plan this thing, this kind of things like in the future, the, the virtual classroom will be an asset of the, of the future school. So probably the museum have to ask uh, uh, to, the, to the schools to be present inside the, this kind of program because uh, it's a, uh, I, I think the next future, the, the situation will be quite the same of the, of the actual. Regarding the, the second question. Hey, Claudio, give me one second just to let Anna to translate. Yeah, excuse me. Uh, in Italy, se han hecho el salón de clases virtual con plataformas como Zoom. Y eh, lo que ellos han hecho es um, contactar al director de la escuela de su territorio. Eh, para pedirle media hora a la semana para integrar contenido del museo en las actividades escolares, eh, como por ejemplo pueden ser visitas virtuales. Y a los niños les ha gustado mucho, han alcanzado hasta 200 estudiantes y es algo con lo que les interesa seguir trabajando para aprovechar el salón de clases virtual y seguir programando con la escuela. Uh, regarding the second question, we have, uh, um... The, the pro we have faced the problem because uh, we, we are working with the school, with the people with the uh, high level of uh, poverty. So nobody has a, a, a proper internet connection to, to, to give us the opportunity to make a digital, a digital and virtual tool. So we have invented the, 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 the solution to, uh, to create a human library so we uh, we phone to the kids uh, one by one 
and uh, recount stories about the territory by testimonials, by us. And so the, the, the kids that listen to stories about the territory and uh, learn something about uh, the district, the cities, the, uh, the streets uh, directly by phone. So we try to, uh, to overcome the digital gap. When uh, the digital gap was uh, uh, very, very hard because the people doesn't have any kind of device, we uh, make a fundraising program in our neighborhood and we buy some tablet to give, for example, to a local mosque in order to give to the mosque the opportunity to recount to the, the citizen all the activities that normally the mosque makes inside the, the, the building to recount the, to tell about the Islamic tradition, the Islamic fast, uh, the Islamic celebration. And so the, the mission for me, for the, for the museum is to act for the community. So to find a solution, not to stop uh, uh, because there are a problem. You have a problem, you have to overcome that problem and you have to act uh, as a museum, as, uh, as something that resolve the problem in order to make possible that the digital cultural heritage can be transmitted and can be uh, recounted. Habla sobre el trabajo con escuelas o gente en situación de pobreza o que no cuentan con una buena conexión y eh, una de las estrategias que han utilizado es llamadas telefónicas donde la gente puede escuchar historias sobre su territorio. En los casos en que no cuenten con ningún dispositivo, eh, el museo sí ha, comp ha comprado tabletas o equipo, por ejemplo, para mezquitas que puedan utilizar en sus edificios y con eh, contenido sobre sus tradiciones. Y eh, la idea es que el Museo Comunitario busque soluciones. Thank you so much. Julián, please, go ahead. Sí, yo, yo quisiera como agregar algo como a, a esta discusión y es que creo que el problema de la tecnología en museos comunitarios es un problema del lenguaje. Y creo que esto hay que tenerlo muy, muy en cuenta porque... Eh, lo que sí he podido ver en, este, en esta situación de, de confinamiento es que muchos museos son muy, eh, pues en español se dice bien, pensantes y tratan de seguir manteniendo unos lenguajes que han manejado toda su vida en las salas de exposición, unos lenguajes muy eh, correctos, muy bien escritos, muy bien, eh, todo muy bien documentado. Pues resulta que la, la comunicación digital es completamente diferente, la comunicación digital es irónica, eh, es políticamente incorrecta, eh, el lenguaje que utilizan las generaciones que están eh, manejando contenidos digitales es un lenguaje diferente, es muy importante poder comprender ese lenguaje, eh, infortunadamente he visto que muchas áreas de comunicación en museos en Colombia no se han arriesgado tanto y las que se han arriesgado han hecho productos absolutamente revolucionarios eh, que inclusive uno de los que mostré era uno de ellos y es una cosa que yo nunca me imaginé que un museo fuera a poner en la esfera pública y es hablar sobre la historia del país cuando en Colombia eso es un tema que la gente joven no quiere saber y con unos pequeños memes logran una revolución que no han logrado los museos en décadas para hablar de historia, entonces es entender el lenguaje, eso es creo que muy muy importante. Um, he's adding that uh, for him the problem of technology in uh, community museums is a problem of language and what we have seen in lockdown is this inaccessible or academic language used. So in digi digital communication should be more ironic, sometimes politically incorrect. It's the language of new generations and it's very important to understand this. And this is not happening on Colombia, uh, with some exceptions of institutions taking some more risks and speaking about the history of the country and creating very revolutionary content in this respect. That, that's fascinating. It's super interesting to think about, um, very interesting to think about how language, the shift in language that has to take place in the museum. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to add to that discussion about uh, schools, maybe K, schools in the... Um... Uh, just, just a quick comment. Um, prior to COVID, um, 
because we had a children's gallery, a lot of our programming was done around getting the children into the space so they could interact with the objects and so on. So COVID kind of forced us to change our strategy a bit more rapidly than we had intended. We had always intended to redevelop the museum and add a more digital component, but we had to sort of fast track that. Um, so for example, we always had workbooks, but they were physical workbooks that they were given when they came to the museum, that kind of thing. We're now trying to fast track putting all that stuff online. Uh, so that's one, one side of it. Uh, the next side of it is um, when we're sort of working with the Ministry of Education and so on, again, we tended to be what type of books are we mm -hmm. going to do? Now we're looking at what type of online resources can we refer teachers to? What kind of online resources can we have on our website or can we have to provide to teachers? And for example, when we're going out to schools, we haven't done that for a while. We're not going with... Yes, we still have our touchables and so on, but now they want a PowerPoint. Now they want something that they can interact with. So we, we're expecting that we have to bring multimedia, that kind of thing. And that's something that we, we've had to be cognizant. We've had to sort of pivot and deal with that in the last two years or so. That is not just let's go talk to the kids. It's let's produce content that makes sense to them that they enjoy, but that they can also refer to. So we're providing more digital content for teachers that they can take the students to afterwards. And we're also making more resources available online. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I-, I Hold on, Alan. Hold on one second, let Anna translate that quick. Sorry about that. Eh, sí, con la situación de COVID, ellos tienen en el museo una galería para niños. Entonces, con la pandemia han tenido que adaptar su estrategia digital rápidamente. Por ejemplo, ellos tenían cuadernos de trabajo eh, físicos que hay que llevarlos en línea. Y trabajando con el Ministerio de Educación, también ahora se enfocan más en los recursos en línea para maestros que piden eh, presentaciones de PowerPoint, por ejemplo. Y han, uh, se han tenido que enfocar en este material en los últimos dos años, más que visitar las escuelas como hacían antes. Ahora se trata de producir contenido. Yeah, I, I, I mean, some, we have a little bit of experience of working with, with schools and, and, um, and museums. And I, I think there's two points I'd like to make. One is that um, when going into a school and with digital technology, whether it be the phone or some sort of game type technology to engage them with, um, they are able to use digital um, literacies that they have developed playing games or using, a, using their mobile phone that they're not normally able to use in a educational setting. And so this is quite often quite, we find quite an, an empowering scenario because the kids kind of both expect to be able to do, you know, work with the phone or work with the game device and they expect that it's gonna be quite in, enjoyable. So I, th I think that it's, it's a really good thing to do. And also, you know, it can be quite a leveler because it's not always the case that the people who are best at reading and writing are the people who are best with the phone or with the or with the, or with the game, and so you can find that people who really struggle with some of the traditional methods actually begin to flower when they're given the op given those sorts of opportunities. Um, and it's quite challenging for the teachers as well. well. Give one, one second to Anna, maybe she can go ahead. Sí, tienen alguna eh, tienen algo de experiencia trabajando con escuelas y museos, y al ir a las escuelas con tecnologías digitales. Eh, los niños pueden utilizar eh, algunas habilidades como que desarrollan jugando que normalmente no usan en un contexto educativo. Entonces, esto es una buena oportunidad para los que batallan con métodos más tradicionales. And the, the second point is that it, it has been really most successful, I think, when the, the kids, it's not just kind of going to them saying, oh, learn this or learn that or, or play with this or play with that. But going to them say, hey, we're, we're a museum and we're developing an exhibit or an exhibition on this topic. And we would really like for you to help us with that. And we think that you could make this or you could make that. And so that that, that, that connection between the museum, it's not just the museum informing the, the children, but it's the, the children bringing their schools, they're bringing their skills to the museum and, and actually helping develop um, exhibits and exhibitions and, and being 
productive? Um, en las estrategias que tienen más éxito es cuando el museo les pide a los estudiantes, a los niños que están desarrollando una exposición, entonces quisieran su ayuda de forma que les permita usar sus propias habilidades de forma productiva. Ok, go ahead. That's to add to what Alan just said. Um, we have something called the Junior Curator Program, which we usually run in the summer. And uh, one of the things we get, these older children, these, these older kids, they're usually between 16 and 25, so I shouldn't really call them kids. But one of the things we get them to do during the summer is to help us to develop content for their peers and also for younger visitors to the museum. And what I've seen over the last couple of years is a shift towards wanting to use their digital technology to do these things. So years ago, they would have done a workbook and we would have had printed copies of the workbooks and they would be basing that. Uh, last summer, I actually had two of my boys get together and they did an online game based on one of the galleries where basically you had to get a bee through the honeycomb to get to the end of the honeycomb by correctly answering questions about things that you observed in the gallery. So I, I think that there's definitely room and scope for letting them incorporate and, and, and explore the use of digital technology in all of the different things we do when we interact with our youth. Sí, agrega que ellos tienen un eh, programa de curadores jóvenes. Es un programa de verano y ellos desarrollan contenido y ha notado que últimamente les interesa mucho más utilizar medios digitales. Eh, y un ejemplo fue que desarrollaron un juego en línea basado en sus galerías. Entonces hay eh, mucha oportunidad de explorar estas opciones. Thank you very much. And I noticed that everybody, almost everybody nodded along with many of these answers. So I find it um, very interesting to see how of the people who are thinking about the technology and technologies in museums um, are really gearing toward innovation. I, I thought that that was really the comment of Julian mentioning about a meme um, regarding history of Colombia. Most kids are just like, history, we don't want to, we're not that interested, but if you make it into a really funny meme, all of a sudden they're entertained, but they also learn something, right? So the opportunity to do that. Um, la oportunidad de poder aprovechar las nuevas tecnologías aparentemente es algo que todos los, los ponentes hoy están, están de acuerdo en que se puede innovar y el museo debería innovar eh, utilizando estas nuevas tecnologías y apoyándonos en los mismos estudiantes y, y sus, su participación y su perspectiva. Um, I think that I would like to finish up the Q&A with one last question that we received. We received several more questions. We can't um, bring them all to the table because um, some of them open up huge cans of worms. So we're just gonna, um, this next one that I wanna address is a pretty big one, but um, let's see if anybody can respond to this. Um, how can you work with a community that wishes to expose their culture and archaeological or exhibit their culture and archaeological heritage, but that unfortunately doesn't have electricity or internet or the accessibility um, to the town itself is really remote? So do you have any suggestions for those cases where um, the limitations are just really quite um, strong, big limitations? Claudio, please. As I said before, <clears throat> um, the museum needs to be, needs to act more, needs to find solutions. We, we need to be, at, we have to be at service of the community, totally at service of the community. So if we, there is a community that needs to expose to, to have, to, to exhibit, uh, their the heritage, we need to help in every, uh, we have to, to buy equipment, to, <laughs> we need to, 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 to share our knowledge, we have to do something that is our strength to do, to, to, to resolve the problem. The, the situation is, a, is, a, is, very, is, a, is very present in Italy, in the south of Italy, especially, and a lot of people in the South of Italy are working with, with this kind of community uh, sharing, uh, the tech sharing. The people goes in their very, very isolated uh, 
villages in Italy that have no internet connection, but uh, as a huge, huge uh, cultural heritage and share technology, share knowledge to create the, the condition to build that community to share all the content or the heritage they want to share. So in this case, we must be problem solver. The, like museum, the museum must be the Mr. Wolf of uh, the film of Tarantino. We need to solve the problem. Uh, responde que el museo debe de actuar más, de encontrar soluciones para servir a la comunidad. Si en el caso de que necesiten herramientas, hay que apoyarlos a conseguirlas, eh, a compartir conocimiento. Esta es una situación en el sur de Italia donde hay muchas comunidades aisladas, sin conexión, y hay que encontrar formas de compartir este contenido y resolver problemas. Mario, go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you for the question. Uh, my apologies because I, I, uh, my internet uh, connection is very bad. Uh, I lose image for some minutes, but I, I'm here. Uh, so um, um, I would like to, uh, to answer two things. One is the connection with schools from the previous question. Okay. Um, museums uh, that must connect with the schools because schools and museums uh, are two sides of the same uh, coin. Uh, we are acting in formal formal education in schools, but we need uh, not non-formal education in the museums. So uh, technology uh, is a way when we talk about gamification, Sometimes this word, gamification, uh, is not very uh, best seen by museum professionals. But uh, uh, um, to, to put content in games is uh, also very important because they learn in a didactical way. Uh, so for Anna to translate, please. Mm -hmm. Eh, el trabajo eh, se refiere en primero al trabajo con escuelas desde los museos y lo importante que es trabajar juntos porque son dos lados de la misma moneda de educación formal e informal y la tecnología tiene un papel muy importante por ejemplo en el caso de los juegos como herramientas de aprendizaje didácticas. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Ana. Um, and now the question about uh, uh, how to uh, work with communities in archaeology, uh, specifically in archaeology in remote communities without electricity, correct? In the very remote areas. Well, uh, it, it's a uh, $1 million question, <laughs> as we can say. But uh, I can share, for instance, one experience. Um, I helped to build a museum in a remote community in Portugal, and the museum was placed in the old school of that small uh, community. And uh, uh, we promote a meeting with all the habitants, there are approximately 42, only 42 habitants, and we explain why the museum there and uh, what we bring there because it was an archaeological remains of that area um, and the community participated in a very uh, interesting way. They have to vote if they, they wanted the museum in their own school, the old school or not, because in one room we maintain the memory of the school and in the other room we show the archaeological remains uh, that were in that uh, community. Um, Anna? Uh -huh. um, eh, sobre el trabajo con comunidades remotas eh, de patrimonio arqueológico, que dice que es la pregunta del millón, pero comparte su experiencia en la que ayudó a construir un museo en una comunidad remota de Portugal y eh, el museo lo ubicaron en una vieja escuela y participaron los 42 habitantes de la comunidad, se reunieron para discutir por qué del museo y las piezas arqueológicas que se iban a incluir. Y, y la comunidad votó sobre esta propuesta 
eh, para tener dos secciones, una sobre la memoria de la escuela y otra para las piezas arqueológicas. Uh, and last part, um, uh, okay, it is possible to work with local communities uh, promoting heritage and some persons with uh, techno techno uh, technological uh, uh, capabilities like smartphones can uh, take pictures and put uh, on social media and to uh, on a website in, in order to show everybody that, com that community exists and have a, a history, uh, have their own objects, and we can spread to the world that they really exist and then have a memory and they want to preserve it. Thank you. Eh, se puede trabajar con comunidades locales eh, promoviendo su patrimonio, eh, simplemente usando los celulares para tomar fotos, compartirlas en redes sociales o en un sitio web, y se puede mm, compartir ampliamente la historia y la memoria de la comunidad. Thank you so much. Um, I think we'll just let Julian answer quickly because he wanted to say something, and then we're going to wrap up because we've, we've been on for quite a while. Sí, eh, dos cosas eh, sobre esta cuestión y es la primera es eh, está en la responsabilidad de los visitantes eh, lo que afirma Mario y es con los smartphones la fotografía eh, las redes sociales puede ser una forma muy poderosa que está fuera de las manos de lo que hace un museo pero hace parte también de la actividad del museo y es cómo se difumina esa información en redes sociales por parte de los visitantes y hay otra cosa que me preocupa más que eh, en este momento eh, de las áreas remotas que no tienen acceso a internet eh, y que no tienen de pronto acceso a tecnologías. Esas áreas no han sido tan afectadas durante esta pandemia. Mal que bien son áreas que están remotas y por ende no han sido tan susceptiblemente afectadas por confinamientos o cuarentenas. Pero yo creo que sí hay una pregunta muy fuerte y es qué pasa con la gente sobre todo en Latinoamérica, de los cinturones de miseria de grandes ciudades como Lima, como Ciudad de México o como Bogotá, que no tienen un computador en su casa, que no tienen ni siquiera para comer y para completar están encerrados en su casa estos niños con sus papás, seguramente aumentando la violencia intrafamiliar, ¿cierto? Y el museo estando completamente incapaz de ayudar a solucionar esta situación y ahí yo sí creo que hay un problema muy importante y es que los museos comunitarios en ciudades tienen una responsabilidad muy grande en este momento de mantener eh, una, una, un tejido social que es muy frágil en las zonas pobres de las grandes ciudades latinoamericanas. Uh, first is the responsibility of visitors of using their smartphones Uh, to take photos, sharing them on social media, and this is part of museum's activities and how to share them. But also speaking about remote areas that maybe haven't been so affected by the pandemic. However, there's a very important question about um, very poor areas in some of uh, the great cities of Latin America, such as Lima or Mexico City, where with the pandemic, we have children staying at home, uh, increased domestic violence, and it is a responsibility of the community museum uh, to work in this social context. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to all the, the panelists. Um, I hope that you've also been looking at the chat All of our listeners have been looking at the chat because we've been receiving great feedback there. And Alan has posted some really interesting links as well as Kay to the game building site and the solar panel um, charging of your phone. And so all sorts of really wonderful um, links there. So we invite you all to, to be checking the chat as well. Um, so with that said, I thank everybody. I thank you so much for your participation. And I hand it over now to Gustavo who's going to do um, a final wrap up of ideas. Thank you, Gustavo. Right, thank you very much, um, Lauren, for your, your wonderful uh, Master of Ceremonies uh, skills. This has gone extremely smoothly. Um, thank you to Jamie for all the background work he did, um, Eva efficient Jamie um, 
and with good humor. And thank you in particular to Anna for wonderful translation. I can vouch for that. Um, she's been extremely precise in both uh, Spanish and English. Wonderful. Um, now, uh, I was asked to sort of summarize what's been happening. Um, and uh, what I thought is, instead of giving you another lots of minutes, I'll just give you five minutes and I'll um, highlight just a couple of phrases from each of you. Um, and I'll end up with what I think is an image of the success of this project. Um, we discussed today, it seems to me, the, 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 the core issue of what we discussed was the challenge of the challenges put to us by, by COVID, by crisis of one sort or another. And should be mentioned that there were crises of other sorts before in the project. Uh, certainly, one can think of two big crises. One was the, the, the floods in Peru that uh, wrecked uh, some of the projects for and made them suffer for several months. And the other one was a crisis in Chile, where we were hoping to have um, a meeting in that wonderful part of Chile, uh, the Lakes region, and we couldn't because um, the, the political situation in Chile was uh, pretty dire. Um, so uh, it seems to me that challenges have been responded um, with resourcefulness. Um, something that incidentally is very much a Latin American thing. Latin America hasn't been traditionally great at inventing wonderful new technology, but has been pretty good at adapting and repairing and using um, local resources to survive and to challenge, to, to, to uh, resolve um, uh, challenges. Um, now, uh, the, the the session today started with uh, Kate Keehan, who used, it seems to me, two core notions that uh, are behind the project and behind all we've been doing. And they are social cohesion, that she refers to as the great task of uh, uh, community museums, and heritage. And the idea of coping with those two, of developing those two. And those themes have been throughout every, every presentation. Um, that Kate was, was followed by Julian, Julian uh, from Colombia, um, who's uh, the great image, it seems to me, about the challenges that he came up with, um, were the idea that uh, it's all very good to have technology and we must uh, use it, but I love the term perifoneo, uh, the idea that we, we're we not just uh, using technology, but we adapt to local circumstances. And the idea of the personal um, loudspeaker, which is still the case in parts of Uruguay, I, I can vouch for that, uh, for news, um, seems to me a wonderful um, image of the um, the combination of tradition and novelty and technology. The, the Voice newspaper, um, which is, of course, has a long tradition in Europe too, um, about the, the news being spoken. Um, and the, um, the Perifoneo seem to me to be wonderful examples of the, of the way in which the museums move forward. This technology uh, must be braveness, it must be challenges to censorship and must be inclusion. Um, we then had a, the very technical and wonderful presentation by Alan and Catherine from um, St. Andrews on the technology that they have developed, uh, which of course we didn't know at the time that it would have an added dimension uh, in times of COVID. And, and obviously in the new normal, whatever that is going to be afterwards. Um, and I think his main message was that uh, technology must ultimately help to provide content to the visitor. 
the idea that you a museum, whether you visit it uh, in person or you do it virtually, the, the great task is to provide it directly to the visitor. Hence all the discussion we had in the questions about the role of uh, personal technology and mobiles. And uh, I, I have to say that having seen some of the, the work that has been done, it, it is quite remarkable how the objects in 3D have been gained. Now, we then move to Kay Hall, who probably has, my view, the, the, the prize for enthusiasm about what's going on in Barbados in that museum. The presentation was uh, extremely enthusiastic. And the one thing, uh, apart from the Desmond photo, which I for one recognize because I used to watch that, and the idea of the mystery portrait, um, the idea of the one minute flat story also is something I'll take away. I rather like that idea. But um, I think her, her advice that you must let the audience guide your choices, but brackets within reason seems to me a very good um, encapsulation of the role of the community museum because you need to listen to the community, but you must also engage in education. In, so there has to be a two-way process. Um, and that seems to me a very important aspect of community museums. There's two ways. There's people there who uh, have ideas, test them, but their job is also to, to encourage um, ideas and thinking. We then had the second uh, non-EU LAC um, contribution. I mentioned Julian's from Colombia, a uh, Latin American, uh, not part of the project, but with extremely helpful and useful and interesting contribution about his local museum. We then had um, Claudio Nessi from the Eco Museum, another European um, um, contribution. And um, uh, from him, I must say the prize there is to a remarkable commitment that came through in, in that amazing work that you're doing, Claudio, there. And I rather like um, a couple of phrases in what you said, if I could pick, I like the idea of a concrete support, which is very clear that's what you're doing where you are. And that um, your phrase that we must be more than a museum is something that again points to the political, the social uh, task of uh, community museums, uh, which is so strong. Um, perhaps uh, not quite overtly the task of national museums, but that came through very strongly here. Um, from there, we moved on to Mario and Jamie. And um, from Mario, I think uh, I rather like uh, the discussion of, um, of uh, um, under COVID and after COVID, and you, what you learned from the two case studies that you gave us, but my phrase for you, from you would be, a museum that does not communicate um, does not exist. And I rather like that phrase, the phrase that a museum is, has to be, has to engage with its community and its visitors. If not, it, it just doesn't work. And I was very um, impressed by that website um, about the service of the museum to the community and the two sections, the section I need help and the section I want to help, where again, things that I, I take away from, from this. Um, as for Jamie, well, what can I say? Uh, the increase of likes of 702%, that's some figure. Uh, and I will take away the figure 30 million, 224,340 minutes of video. That's a big fi uh, figure to, to boast about, Jamie. Right, and finally, um, it didn't come through here in particular, but this, you know, is a third webinar we've had. And um, there's one image that, to me, um, is particularly indicative of the of the work of the EU LAC project. And that is um, that through this project, 
two communities that were um, recognized by UNESCO, by um, the uh, Na United Nations Agency for, for Education and Science um, as representing immaterial, intangible um, uh, patrimony are uh, two water organizations. And that through this project, the Tribunal de las Aguas from Valencia, yeah, the Water Tribunal from Valencia, which is a, a, a very ancient organization that dictated, that organizes the water in that very arid part of Spain and administers it beyond the uh, the uh, capacity or the control of governments, um, that tribunal of elders, uh, judges, went across to Peru and went to the uh, Aguas de Corongo in Peru and met up, met up with the jueces del agua de Corongo. And there's a photo on the um, EU LAC Museum's Facebook that you can see uh, which has the two dressed in their own traditional attire, um, speaking to each other and recognizing that actually there are links and that no doubt they can learn from each other, as I'm sure they have done. And that in Peru, um, the, the university um, country where uh, one of the great contributors to, to this project uh, um, has now passed away, uh, Luis Repetto um, uh, organized this meeting. And uh, perhaps we could close by, well, I could close by remembering his role in this and that great achievement. So uh, that's my, my take on this. Thank you. Thank you all very much for uh, everybody for the um, uh, three hour stay with us. So thank you, and I hope you enjoyed it. It's over to Jamie, I think, now. Or to Karen. Karen's going to say. I'll say, I'll say a quick thank you um, before I hand over to Jamie and to Lauren. Um, thank you so much, Gustavo, for that very eloquent summary. Um, it's another illustration of how much this project has worked together as a team, not just with our researchers, but really closely with our steering committee members and on our advisors, you, Lauren, Peter Davis, and the others. And as Peter said last time, um, it's been in a collaborative role, not just an advisory role. So we really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, as this is our last of this three series of webinars, um, again, I just want to take the time to say a big, big thank you to Jamie for all of his organization, to Lauren for moderating the three sessions so expertly, to Kate for her contribution today and to all else within our project. Um, and as Gustavo said, an amazing thank you to Anna, who's made this so much more accessible between the two regions, you're an absolute star. Um, so I don't have a lot to say. I've enjoyed every minute of this and thank you for staying with us. Thank you for your support and yeah, watch the space. Okay, so I'll hand over to Jamie. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you, Karen. And finally, um, we would just like to go through some final technical information. As we mentioned earlier in the presentation, if you would like a certificate of participation for this webinar or indeed webinar one or two, <laughs> please do email us um, at eulacmuseums at standrews.ac.uk. I would just like to take this opportunity to reiterate um, what Karen and Gustavo has said of thanks for everyone for taking part. And I'm delighted to say that we have had 1,416 people register via Zoom for our webinar series, which is a fantastic result for our project and for bi-regional co cooperation between our regions. Our panellists have included EULAC Museum's researchers and international experts and showcased technologies today and innovation across our region in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. On behalf of the EULAC Museum's project and consortium, thank you so much for joining us today. 
We wish you to stay safe during this pandemic and you're always welcome to take part in our web portal and future events. Thank you so much and take care. Goodbye. Bye, thank you everybody. Bye, thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure. Bye. 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 Bye.